exploiting error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. So here we are, uh, the first exploitation section of this course, even though we've already covered that in the previous section, but we're going to be starting off by taking a look at in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities. And the first uh, video within this section is going to be focused on the first subtype of in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities, and that is error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. Now, we've already taken a look at how to identify and exploit error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities in the previous section, but that was, of course, more so focused on the methodologies and the processes behind that and uh, you know how to do it manually or how to identify uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities manually and how to go about you know exploiting them uh, manually and both through the use of a you know web proxies uh, whether it be burp suite or OWASP zap so we're now going to turn our attention to a much more realistic approach where we'll be you know focusing on real world web applications and that's what we'll be doing in this video however uh, before we do that we need to go through some uh, theoretical uh, explanations or you know uh, demonstrations uh, so that I can highlight uh, firstly where we are with regards to the uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities types and subtypes uh, and I'll introduce you once again to error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities and sort of outline a general uh, ex identification and exploitation methodology that you can follow uh, tailored towards error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. So uh, to begin with, uh, we'll revisit, or we are going to revisit, as you can see here, the uh, SQL injection types and subtypes hierarchy tree that I had introduced uh, to you or that I'd shown you earlier on in this course, where uh, we essentially have the SQL injection vulnerabilities um, tree that defines the various types and subtypes of SQL injection vulnerabilities. And I've already introduced you to them. So we're starting off with in-band SQL injection. So that's this section. And to begin with, in this video, we're taking a look at error-based SQL injection. In the next video, we'll take a, a look at union-based SQL injection. And then in the next section, uh, we'll take a look at blind SQL injection um, uh, subtypes, so Boolean-based and time-based. And as I mentioned earlier in this course, we're not going to be exploring out-of-band SQL injection, even though we'll be exploring maybe a little bit of this uh, in this video and this uh, demonstration. So this video will have a live lab associated with it. Uh, we'll get to the practical section at the end of the slides. And uh, the main differentiating factor between um, the, exploita uh, the exploitation sections of this course and the previous section where we were focused on finding SQL injection vulnerabilities is that we will be utilizing a real world web application as opposed to something like OWASP Motility. So this will sort of give you a real feel as to how you'd go about identifying and exploiting, uh, in this case, an error-based SQL injection vulnerability in the wild. So with that being said, this is where we are. I've sort of highlighted it here so you can see where we are at this point and we'll be following this methodology. So. We're taking a look at error-based SQL injection. Now, of course, before we take a look at one of the subtypes, which in this case is error-based SQL injection, we need to get an understanding of the primary type or category uh, under which error-based SQL injection falls, and that is in-band SQL injection. So I've already gone through this, but I thought it's uh, important to go through it again. Uh, you know, so that we don't skip over anything or in case you've forgotten, uh, this might be a good refresher. So what is in-band SQL injection? Well, in-band SQL injection is the most common type of SQL injection attack, and it occurs when an attacker utilizes the same communication channel to send the attack and receive the, the results, right? Or the actual results of the SQL query that they injected. In other words, what this means is that the attacker injects the malicious SQL code or query or payload. Again, I use those terms interchangeably. So the attacker injects malicious SQL code into the web application and then receives the results of the uh, SQL code that was injected through the same channel that was used to submit the code. This will typically be the web application itself. So when we talk about in-band, the key, the key thing to take note of is that the injection and the return of the results is done through the same communication channel. And when I refer to the communication channel, I'm typically referring to the web application. So if you're on a particular web page uh, or a page on the web application and you find an application input and you, uh, you, know, you essentially inject your SQL query in there, 
the the whole idea behind inbound SQL injection is that the results of the SQL query that you injected will be returned on that page. So in the case of error based injection, we would you know for example use the single uh, the single quote exploit where we you know put a single quote to uh, sort of invoke an error. Uh, so if executed by the database, the uh, result of that execution will uh, essentially prompt the web application to tell you that, hey, you have an issue with your SQL query. And that sort of confirms the fact that an, an error-based SQL injection vulnerability exists. Now, in-band SQL injection attacks are quite dangerous, obviously, because uh, not only uh, because of how they operate in that, you know, you're utilizing a single communication channel, but you can also very easily use it to steal sensitive information, modify or delete data, or take over an entire web application or even the entire server. And we'll talk about how to gain access to data that is stored in the database by leveraging, uh, even in this case, an error-based SQL injection vulnerability. So sort of going over the diagram that, again, I had used in the intro sections of this course, um, I want to you know use the in-band SQL injection diagram here. So Again, we have the attacker or the pen test or the bug bounty hunter, which is typically going to be you. And you are performing a security assessment on a web application and you're connecting to it via the internet, right? Now pay attention to these directional arrows and where they're going and where they're coming from. So during an in-band SQL injection attack, the penetration tester will find a way to ask the web application for desired information. So in this case, we threw an HTTP request or Firstly, we find uh, an application input uh, that uh, will interact with the database uh, based on its nature. Uh, secondly, there shouldn't be any uh, input validation. Uh, and so what we do is we find that injectable uh, application input or a parameter that is injectable, and uh, we inject our SQL query or payload or your code. Uh, and uh, in, in this case, the example I've used here is uh, SQL query to list user accounts right um, within a particular table. So we send that over, it's injected successfully. The web server, you know, treats it as regular data because there's no input validation and makes um, essentially a request or an SQL query to the database saying, hey, uh, can you verify whether this information exists? Uh, again, using a legitimate query and then the appended injected queries, what is executed by the database by virtue of your injection, as we explored in the previous section, as well as the uh, SQL uh, primer or fundamental section of this course. So the database doesn't know what is legitimate and what is not. It's been given an SQL query to execute. And if it's syn uh, syntactically valid, um, then it will essentially, uh, you know, process the SQL query and return the data. The web application receives the data and will display the results on typically uh, the page where the injection was performed. So in this case, you can see the uh, injected SQL query was asking to list user accounts from a particular table. That is all done successfully. And uh, the web application returns with the results from the database, which in this case are the user accounts and the examples here are admin, John and Mike. So that brings us to error-based SQL injection, right? So error-based SQL injection is a technique used by attackers to exploit SQL injection vulnerabilities in web applications, obviously. And it relies on intentionally causing database errors and using the error messages returned by the database to extract information or gain unauthorized access to the application's database. So the error message, uh, the reason we do this is because the error message can contain valuable information about the database schema or the contents of the database itself, as we'll see shortly, uh, which the attacker can then use to further exploit the vulnerability. That's something we'll explore as well. So the process of identifying error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities will involve testing the web application in order to determine if it is susceptible to this type of attack. And we explored the process of identifying error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. So the key thing here, going back to in-band and how this relates to error-based is that when we talk about error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities or the exploitation of error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities, this is an in-band SQL injection attack or vulnerability, which means that uh, we're using that functionality, that in-band functionality to uh, essentially inject a, a particular special character or a payload or an SQL code or query that will invoke an error 
right? And the objective here is that the web application will return that error. And that error typically contains useful information about the backend database, right? So how do you go about identifying and exploiting an error-based SQL injection vulnerability in the wild? Well, there's a really cool methodology that I put together that I think works really well. So number one, you need to identify an application input uh, that doesn't have any input validation and one that interacts with the database by, uh, by the nature of how it works, right? And we talked about that in the previous section. A good example of this is a login form. So what you're supposed to do is identify the injectable application input, or in this case, the vulnerable parameter, the parameter that's vulnerable to injection, right? And uh, this involves finding a parameter in the web application that is vulnerable to SQL injection, typically through the, the uh, user input fields, you, uh, URL parameters or form inputs. Uh, what you do next is to inject malicious SQL code. So you need to craft a payload that includes SQL statements that are designed to trigger a database error. This can involve appending invalid SQL syntax, like a single quote, or manipulating existing queries. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that when we are exploring union-based SQL injection, right? The third step is to observe the error messages, right? So your job here is to submit the payload or inject the payload to the vulnerable parameter and then observe the error message returned by the database. And because it's an in-band SQL injection vulnerability, it's going to do that via the same page typically that you injected the uh, SQL query into or you know, on the same page uh, that has the injectable parameter or has the application input that is vulnerable to SQL injection. And the key thing we're looking for here is useful information about the backend database, which can also delve into, you know, enumeration of data within the database. And that can be facilitated through tools like uh, SQL map, which we'll actually be exploring in this video in the practical side. Once you've, uh, you've done that, you can choose to extract data. Now, this is typically not needed in a bug bounty uh, when you're doing bug bounty hunting or in a standard web application pen test. Uh, however, it may be requested. So in your proof of concept, as long as you prove that an injection vulnerability exists, that's pretty much it. But you may be asked to go a step further uh, to essentially prove the severity of the SQL injection vulnerability. Essentially, what companies will ask you to do is, to, uh, is they'll say, OK, once you've identified the SQL injection vulnerability, can you please show us what data you can access via or by leveraging that SQL injection vulnerability? So the, your job here at this point is to modify the payload to extract specific information from the database by leveraging the error messages. So this can in, uh, include retrieving usernames, passwords, or other sensitive data that's stored in the database. And I've already sort of explained that. And uh, then, of course, you know, that ties into the final one, which is exploiting uh, the information gathered through the error-based SQL injection uh, vulnerability or attack to further exploit the application. So, you know, a good example of this is when you perform the uh, extraction of data, you may choose to dump the users, uh, the users or the accounts table, for example, within the database and get access to uh, user accounts on that web application. And, you know, in some cases, the passwords may be unencrypted or they may be encrypted using a weak hashing algorithm like MD5 that can easily be cracked. The point is you, you use the data within the database to further your access or your exploitation of the web application as a whole. So imagine if you gain access to the admin credentials for the web application and you log in as the as the actual admin of the website. Well, you now pretty much own the website. And from that point on, you can, you know, you can increase your, uh, the scope of the attack uh, much further. And uh, of course, I'm going to use the diagram here to sort of uh, illustrate error-based SQL injection. So the, you know, using the, the previous example as a guide, we have the attacker, which is you, and we have the web application, which, which consists of the web server and the database and uh, the, the point is you once you've found the application input that is vulnerable to injection or you're performing your testing, uh, you you know you inject a SQL payload that will trigger an error, right? And that is sent over. The web application does not have any input validation, which means it, the request is sent to the database. The database sees the uh, SQL query and obviously identifies the error. And it says, hey, it uh, responds to the web application by saying, hey, there's an error here. And the web application will typically return that error telling you, depending on the DBMS being used, whether it's MySQL or uh, something like PostgreSQL, as we explored in the previous section, 
uh, specific DBMSs will have their own error messages that you know will tell you what database is uh, what uh, DBMS is being used. So, for example, is it MySQL, Postgres, uh, PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL database server, etc. And that firstly confirms that the injection vulnerability exists, and you can then use that. You can use error-based injection to identify or learn more about the uh, backend database and even extract data and you know. Uh, uh, essentially follow through with your attack or the exploitation of the vulnerability. So that brings us to the actual demo. So as I said, in this, uh, this video has a lab environment attached to it. Now this lab environment will provide you with access to a real world web application and you will require your own Kali Linux system. So this lab does not provide you with a Kali Linux system, which means you need to have yours. I'll be walking you through how to set up or how to install tools if they are required, but just keep that in mind. So you can choose to go through this video after uh, you've gone through the lab, or you can choose to go through the walkthrough section after you've gone through the lab yourself, or you can go through it with me or watch the video first and then go through it after. Uh, whatever the case, the Final point I'll say here is that you don't need to follow my exploitation methodology. I'm just going to go through it as I typically would when identifying and exploiting error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. With that being said, let me switch over into my own Kali Linux VM. And once you start up the lab, just copy the URL and you should be able to access it via the internet. So let me switch over and uh, we can get started. All right, so I am back within my own Kali Linux VM and I've copied the URL that the lab has provided me with, and we are going to be utilizing a, a web proxy like Burp Suite. You can use OWASP Zap, it's pretty much the same. We're not gonna be using any specific features within them like uh, the OWASP Zap fuzzer or the payloads, but uh, let's start Burp up here and I'm going to utilize the Burp browser uh, just so that I don't have to you know, go through the process of configuring my proxy within Firefox or my uh, my personal browser here. So I'll go into proxy and open the browser. And uh, once this opens up, I'll just paste in the link here. There we are. So you'll get a similar sort of a URL. Yours will be different, but I'll just uh, disable intercept for now. And the web application is going to load. And here is the one. This is the web application that we need to uh, that we're going to be targeting. So this um, web application is vulnerable to different types of SQL injection vulnerabilities, but the primary one is error based, right? And uh, the first thing, as you remember, is we need to identify application inputs. Now we'll do this manually. And again, I'm using my own methodology. Hopefully you're able to learn by following along. And uh, hopefully my screen is zoomed in uh, to the extent or to a degree where you can see everything. But there we are. You can see that uh, we have a search bar here, which is always a great starting point. Uh, we don't really know much about the web application. If we view the web, uh, the source here, uh, we can see that just by taking a look at it, if we just explore it a little bit here, it looks like it is a PHP based web application. There's, so there's a good chance that it's running on Linux uh, typically, although we still need to perform a little bit more enumeration. So you, you can go through the standard, uh, you know, web app um, enumeration phase where you, or information gathering phase where you're trying to identify more about the, uh, the actual web application and the web server. So in this case, you know, if we try and find the robots.txt file, uh, we are greeted with this uh, default Apache banner, which tells us that, you know, we are running on Linux. So we know that it's Linux uh, is the underlying server. Apache is the web server technology. And in terms of Linux, it's running an Ubuntu server. And we know the server side programming language is PHP. So there's a good chance that we're dealing with an open source uh, uh, relational database or RDBMS or DBMS uh, like MySQL or MariaDB or PostgreSQL. We still don't know that, right? So we'll go back here and uh, we have another application input. So login, uh, which looks quite interesting. And we also have the search functionality here. So let's go back home and test the first one. So we'll test each one. And I'll just uh, go into burp here and I'll turn on intercept and uh, I will just go ahead and perform and just search for something random like test and I'll click on search. All right. So within the HTTP request that is intercepted by burp, we can see that no parameters are passed in the URL. However, they are passed as the or in the body 
of the actual request. So we can see in this case, the parameter is words preformat, and we have the value of the parameter, which is test. All right, so what's the first thing we can do? Uh, the first thing we can do is obviously try uh, utilizing the single quote here to see whether we uh, can invoke an error. So I'm going to forward that. And if we go back to the web application, you can see it tells us immediately, based on how the web application is designed, that we have a database error. And if we take a look at the text here, it tells us or it gives us one of these uh, unique banners or banners unique to a particular DBMS. So you have an error in your SQL syntax. Check the manual that corresponds to your MySQL server version. So just based on this, we know we're dealing with a MySQL database. Now, it also displays uh, where we are having an issue with the syntax, right? And in this case, it doesn't display the entire SQL query, just what comes after the single quote when we essentially terminate the string literal. So we can see that after that, it uh, says in Boolean mode, order by name. So it looks like a typical search query that is searching for uh, specific posts or specific pages that have been stored within the database and it's trying to order them uh, by their name. All right, we don't know much or anything about the table or the uh, the columns that are being referenced here because we can't see the first part of the SQL query, right? Now, what does this tell us? Well, firstly, we've identified this site is vulnerable to error-based SQL injection. And we've done that through the use of very simple payload. Now, you could have done this manually or you could have fuzzed this with something like, uh, you know, the OASP Zap fuzzer, all right? Which you can also do with, um, you can also do this with Burp Suite. So again, I can also show you that, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we also have the login uh, right over here. So I'm just going to disable intercept shortly and we can test this out. So what I'm going to do is turn on intercept now and I'll just pass in, I'll just pass in some test parameters. So test and password and I'll hit login here and you can see it's passed in the body of the request. In this case, it's a post request, which makes sense. And nothing is passed in the URL, right? So no parameters in the URL, which is perfectly fine. So what we can do is we can send this to the repeater here. And, uh, you know, we can play around with this and see whether e whether any of these fields is vulnerable to SQL injection. So I can, you know, change that to a single quote. We don't need any URL encoding. So we'll hit send. We take a look at the response here. And, uh, you know, we look at this here, it says, uh, we can't see anything that looks interesting, any error message, but it says the username you entered cannot be found. We can also try and render this to see what it looks like. There we are. So it looks like, it doesn't look like this particular form is vulnerable. However, we can still put it through ex uh, extensive tests by utilizing the, uh, for example, in this particular case, uh, we can send it to the intruder if we go into the intruder, we can utilize this uh, is sort of the fuzzer, the um, OASP or rather the burp suite equivalent of the OASP zap fuzzer. And I've already covered this functionality and how to use all of these modules within burp suite and OASP zap respectively in its own course, which is the web proxies course. So again, I highly recommend that you go through it. So what we want to do is test both of these payload positions, which have already been added automatically for us. Uh, for SQL injection vulnerabilities. So we can leave it as is and we can go into payloads and we can load a custom payload list. So rem remember in the previous section, we generated or we generated a custom SQL injection payload list and we can load that in here, which has, uh, you know, the set of um, SQL injection payloads, a very small list, but uh, we'll go ahead and we've selected the position so we can start the attack. And the community version of Burp Suite will uh, limit the number of requests. So there we are. Let's see if we get any change in the length of the response here. And there's about 154 payloads that is going to fuzz. And again, you can do this same process or you can go through the same process with um, OASP Zap. It's entirely up to you. I just want to show you what I would typically do. Once I start using a specific web proxy, I end up just going through the entire assessment with it unless I need some bespoke feature set. So I'm going to let this complete and then we'll take a look at the, uh, the actual results. All right, so the intruder attack or the fuzzing is complete. 
Now, one thing when using a uh, burp suite to focus on is the uh, the actual length of the response and the status code. So in this case, they're all 200 status codes, which means we got a, uh, a response, which is great. However, we can see that for the first few, the length is pretty much uniform, right? So we can actually view the response here. And uh, if you take a look at the responses for the first few set of payloads that we're already familiar with that, you know, can typically be used to bypass uh, a login screen, uh, we can see that uh, you if we go into the actual response and you click on render, it'll actually show you what the response looks like. And if I expand the page here, uh, you'll be able to see that. So we can go through uh, the ones that, so, you know, uh, any response with a length, uh, length of three, uh, 3046 bytes here uh, or kilobytes will all, uh, all look to have the same type of response from the web application. So this is very common fuzzing uh, what you're looking for is anomalies. So in this case, we have 352, right? Or 3052, which also looks like the same sort of response. The only reason it's a bit larger is because the size of the payload we injected or we are fuzzing for in this case uh, have increased. What we're looking for is anomalies. So you can see they pretty much all have around the same size. However, we do have some very interesting ones like 2696. So if we click on this, in this case, we can see, aha, we have a database error. So we know there is SQL injection is indeed possible. Why? Uh, firstly, there's multiple application inputs, but in this case, we're, test we're testing the login form. Uh, and also there isn't any input validation. Now we've confirmed that it exists, but were we able to see any payloads that look like they were successful in either A, bypassing the login form, uh, or, you know, giving us any type of data. Well, in this case, not really, apart from bypassing the login form, these payloads typically just, um, typically just confirm SQL injection, which is all that we would really want when doing a bug bounty, uh, when we are bug bounty hunting, right? So if we click on this one here, we can see that, you know, we get the, the SQL error. So we've pretty much confirmed it and, uh, you know, for some of them, we have the query being returned or the error, uh, the mistake with the query as it were. So if we click on some of these here uh, that we are familiar with, like, um, you know, or one equals one, and then we use the comment, we can see that once it renders, it looks like we have an error, etc. And, you know, you can go ahead and take a look at the, the responses with uh, varying lengths or non-uniform lengths here. And uh, at this point, you know, we have confirmed it, but I'm going to show you shortly how we can go about identifying or identifying additional payloads that can help us perform uh, enumeration or can help us identify more information about the database, uh, as is our goal or as was our goal in the slides. So you can see for this one, for example, it looks like there we are. Very, very interesting. So this one here, this payload here specifically says, uh, you know, it utilizes this, this pre-built payload with, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, uh, double quotes, and using a logical operator, one equals zero, which is false, and then union select admin, and uh, we don't get any information there. All right, so we know that SQL injection uh, a SQL injection vulnerability exists, more specifically error-based within the initial search form, as well as the login form. Let's perform a few more tests on some of the um, of the other application inputs that we have. Now, uh, with Burp Suite, the community edition, we really can't save these results. So I'm just going to exit out of here, or you can actually minimize it, but I'll just exit here. And uh, there we are, I'll just discard it. We don't really need it at this point. And I'll get rid of the intruder session there, as well as this one here. And under the proxy, we'll just forward that request. So. Uh, we know that it uh, that there is a SQL injection vulnerability. You could have taken any of those payloads and then tested them manually here. In this case, we know the single quote doesn't work, which is perfectly fine. I'm just going to disable intercept. And the other one, of course, is the search uh, functionality here, which uh, has a PHP file called find recipe. And in the beginning, when we use this search form, we can see that it has a PHP file or it's utilizing a PHP file called do search, right? So if we're going to search here and we just type in, for example, test in any of these fields and let me turn on the intercept. I want to see something, uh, you know, I'm just testing to see what's going on. So I'll hit search and we can see no parameters passed in the URL. 
However, the parameters and their values are passed in the body of the request. In this case, this is a post request. So we can see that we have, uh, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, and six parameters. All right, now, are any one of these injectable? Well, again, in this case, we can utilize the Burp Suite Intruder or the OASP Zap Fuzzer. It's, again, entirely up to you to test them for SQL injection vulnerabilities. So what we'll do in this case, let's send this to the Intruder and we can test the first two for SQL injection vulnerabilities, the first two parameters, that is. So I'll just clear the predefined ones here and we'll say, for example, I want you to add a place there and I also want you to encapsulate this here and actually hold on let me get rid of that one there we can add a space typically that usually works just to highlight that there and we can add this one here so uh, in this particular case hold on let me just make sure that is working and in this particular case we can just uh, say we want to add it in here so i'm just going to you know say test for example just keep that as is and also add one here all right so these are the two that we want to test for now if we go into payloads we're just going to use the same one we used from the previous section of this course and again you can just copy a set of sql injection payloads from the github repo that has them save them in a text file and you now have a fuzzing uh a fuzzing list or a payload list as it were and we can go ahead and start this attack so again this will be throttle when using burp suite and we want to take a look at the responses. So this is going to take a few seconds to a couple of minutes, and I'm just going to wait for this to complete, and then we'll analyze the results. Uh, apologies, just realized as that was going on that we made a few mistakes with the positions here, where I had uh, sort of added... Uh, I had sort of encapsulated words exact as a payload. So I'm just going to uh, reset them again. And I'll show you what I'm doing. So words all is a parameter. So I'll add a value or a section there. And uh, we then have words exact equals test. And we want to highlight this here. So I'll add that there. And in this particular case, uh, we can uh, essentially add, uh, you know, test here as well, just to make sure it's, it works simply. This is something I typically like doing with Zap, but again, just the same thing. I'll start the attack again, and uh, this time I'll just take a look at the request just to see that it's working. There we are, uh, and it's going to go through both of them or iterate through both parameters. So right now it's going through words all, and then it's going to go through words exact. So uh, once it's done with the first round, uh, you'll then see it goes through the second uh, parameter, which is words exact and checks it for injection. So uh, let me see if I can show you this here. We're almost halfway done. Um, and if we were to check the actual size of that payload that we had uh, generated, so this was stored on the desktop, SQL injection, and uh, there we are. So this is about 77. So after the 77th one is then going to uh, start testing the second parameter here, which is words exact for injection. So we're almost there actually. And uh, in fact, we can actually continue without waiting for this to complete. So there we are 77. So uh, the 78th one should start testing words exact. There we are, fantastic. So we can take a look at the results here. So again, we looks like we have some common lengths here for some of the payloads. These, uh, if we take a look at the response and render, these all look like failed responses, so no recipes found. We're performing searches. Uh, we have a bit of an anomaly here, so that looks like an increase in terms of the size of the payload. If we check this one here, it looks like the first parameter is injectable, so that is um, words all. And the reason for that is obviously because we get the database error. So we know it is vulnerable to error-based SQL injection. And in this case, it also gives us the uh, remaining section of the query or the second part of the query after the injection point or after we've terminated the string literal using the single quote. And if we go to anything after, like for example, the, uh, the second parameter, so words exact that also looks like it is vulnerable because we get an error here 
So uh, now that we've identified all application inputs and we know that really all of them are injectable, the question is which one do we start off with with regards to you know uh, performing or utilizing payloads to gather more information? Well, the one we can start off with, and again, I'm not going to wait for the fuzzing to complete here because we've already identified what we needed to identify. I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to discard that, and we can forward that request there. And there we are. So we'll go back to the web app and we can now proceed with the next phase. So now that we've identified the application inputs, we've tested them, we know that there is no input validation. And we know that pretty much all of them with regards to specific parameters are vulnerable to error based SQL injection with specific payloads. Uh, we can now turn our attention to identifying or performing, uh, you know, essentially learning more about the database and the web application itself through the use of other payloads. So going back to the GitHub repo where we copied, you know, some of these SQL injection payloads, you can now look for error based uh, payloads here that can be utilized to uh, enumerate information about the database. So for example, uh, in this particular case, we can try and enumerate the MySQL version or the version of the database using this payload. And uh, the way we can do that is obviously by uh, injecting it. So I'll just disable intercept and we can utilize the search here and uh, we'll use the exact phase, uh, the exact phrase parameter. And uh, what we can do is just say test and I'm going to turn in or turn on intercept and we can then search and then inject it in here. So I'm just going to, for the parameter words exact, I'm just gonna paste in the payload there. And in this case, we're going to add the comment and uh, we're also going to add the single quote delimiter. And this may not work, so I'm just going to copy this here. So it's a lot of testing now with regards to payloads. And I'll walk you through how we can automate this, but I'll say forward, all right? There we are. So in this particular case, it's saying we uh, the injection is successful. However, it says that we have a syntax error. So this payload might not be applicable. All right. And uh, if we go into this and we go back into search or we sort of resend that again and we paste in the payload there, I'm just going to URL encode it because in certain cases, this might be causing the issue. So there we are, single URL encode and forward that. And let's see what we get. Uh, still, we still get a database error. So again, just uh, make another request there, paste that in, maybe try double URL encoding in case any special characters are not being sent successfully in the URL. So forward that there. And uh, yeah, that's uh, typically when you do a double URL encoding that will also convert the string or the SQL query. So we don't want to do that. So we'll, we can go back to that GitHub repo here and try and uh, try and find some others. Now, of course, as you can obviously tell, this will take a lot of time and we're dealing with error based injection here. So it's again, it's all going to depend on the back end or the DBMS being used and um, you know how the web application is designed, what query is being used, etc. The point I'm making is at this point, we typically want to utilize a tool like SQL map. All right, now, what is SQL map? I'll just introduce you to it here. I'll just perform a quick Google search. Uh, I'll open up their website and I'll give you an intro to it. So SQL map is an open source penetration testing tool that automates the process of de detecting and exploiting SQL injection flaws and taking over database servers. It comes with a powerful detection engine, many niche features for the ultimate penetration tester. In our case, the, re the reason we want to use it in this case is to identify the payload that we can use to enumerate uh, information or to get information from the database. And uh, in most cases, when you're dealing with real world web applications, the standard vanilla SQL payloads displayed here will only work great for identifying the vulnerability, but not really for information extraction. So the point I'm making is firstly, we're using it to generate payloads and it'll do it really well for us. And as you can see here, the uh, SQL map comes with a powerful detection engine, many niche features for the ultimate penetration tester and a broad range of switches lasting from database fingerprinting, which is fantastic, which we've uh, done at a basic level. We have made an assumption about, we know it's running MySQL, but not the exact version. 
uh, over data fetching from the database to accessing the underlying file system and executing commands on the operating system via out-of-band connection. So SQL, uh, SQL map is what is typically used for out-of-band SQL injection in that once the injection is performed, uh, we essentially get the database to communicate to another endpoint, which in this case is controlled by SQL map. With that being said, let's take a look at how to use it. So to use it on Linux, specifically on Kali Linux, uh, you want to make sure your repositories are updated and you can install it by saying sudo apt get install SQL map. All right. It's typically not installed by default on Kali. In my case, it looks like uh, we have an update here. So I'll go ahead and uh, go through the update. It's always good to keep it up to date. And uh, what I'm going to do now is just wait for this to complete. There we are. And there we are. So you can launch SQL map by saying it's a command line utility by just opening up the help menu. And again, we're not focusing on all the features here. We're going to go through these exploitation videos and I'm going to show you a little bit about how to use it. And by the end of it, you should know all of the essentials. So it's a very, very, very powerful tool. And I'm showing you how to use it firstly to generate the error based payload that can help us get information from the database information that can be used to learn more about the, the database, uh, how data is stored, tables, etc. And then once that is done, uh, we can actually utilize SQL map to dump the tables, the uh, columns within tables, so on and so forth. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at. So. I'll just nav navigate to the desktop and let's identify the application input that we want to test. So let's use the search one here. So do search.php. Going to go back into burp suite and I'm going to show you a really easy way of using SQL map. So intercept is on. I'm going to just uh, resubmit this here and we can again test for the same one here. So words exact equals will test this parameter for injection. And uh, we want to save this post request. All right. So you just want to copy it. Burp Suite allows you to do this. And uh, I'm going to open up a text editor here and I'm going to paste it in as is. And I'm going to save it on my desktop as request.txt. So save it as a text file. So in this case, I'll just save it as request. There we are. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because when a lot of people are learning or are using SQL map, they typically will uh, need to specify the URL manually, uh, the parameter that they want to inject, uh, as well as the type of uh, injections they want to test for. So in this case, we've already identified that, you know, it's error based injection, which will save us a lot of time. So I'll just forward that request there. And we'll go back into our terminal. So first things first, uh, what can you do? Uh, what's the typical way of using SQL map, right? So the typical way is uh, very, very, very simple. And that uh, will typically involve, you know, running a command like, um, and this is again, without the, the actual request file, we say SQL map uh, U for the URL. And then within double quotes, we want to put in the URL itself. So we can just copy it. So again, copy the injectable URL, or the URL of the page that uh, is where you you're performing the injection. So within the double quotes, I'll put it in here. And now you typically say, uh, you typically specify the data that you want to submit or the parameter. So in this case, data is going to be words exact. So the name of the uh, of the parameter. So words exact is equal to and then close the quotes there. And then you can say uh, P for the uh, payload. In this case, the payload is going to be words exact. So where you want to inject the payloads or where you want SQL map to inject the payloads. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And then the method in this case is post, all right? Because this is a post request. If we take a look at the request here that we saved, it's a post request. So that this is one way of doing it. And this will work just fine. However, this usually causes issues with some of the later version of uh, the later versions of SQL map. So what I typically like doing is saving the request and leaving SQL map to identify the rest like the URL, etc, and whether to use SSL. So what we can do now is uh, essentially say SQL map, and uh, we specify R for request, 
and then make sure you are within the working directory where you saved the request or just specify the absolute path to the request file or the file containing the request. And then you specify the payload. So where you want uh, the parameter you want injected, in this case, words exact, right? So we'll say words um, exact. And now we want to, um, what we can do is specify the technique that we want to use which will save us a lot of time. And again, I'm showing you some really useful uh, tips and tricks. So with SQL map, you can specify the technique, SQL injection technique, so error-based, uh, Boolean-based, union, um, etc. In this case, we'll, let's go for error-based because we've already identified that it's an error-based SQL injection vulnerability. And uh, we're going to hit enter, all right? Now it's going to ask us to uh, that it got a 307 redirect because it's an HTTPS site and it doesn't have an invalid um, SSL cert. We're just going to hit enter for the default option, which is yes. It's now going to ask you do you, um, the there is a redirect because of the redirect uh, because it's a post request. Do you want to send or resend the original post data to a new location? Uh, the answer to that is no. Always set that to no, especially with post requests. All right, so we'll give it a couple of seconds. It's now going to ask you right over here, if we take a look at the results, um, heuristic uh, or basic tests show that the post parameter words exact might be injectable and the possible database management system is MySQL. All right, we already knew that. And then it says testing for SQL injection on post parameter words exact. It looks like the backend database management system is MySQL. Do you want to skip uh, to skip test payloads specific for other DBMSs? Yes, we do because we already know it's MySQL. So there's no need uh, of running um, or testing payloads for other database management systems like PostgreSQL, etc. So I'll hit yes. Um, it's going to say uh, after that, for the remaining test, you want to include all tests for MySQL extending provided level one and risk one value. So level one refers to the depth and risk one refers to the types of payloads that will be used with regards to what type of information they'll extract. So if you're doing a bug bounty, if you're, you know, if you're doing bug bounty hunting or web application pen test, always leave the level and risk at one and I'll explain what these levels and risk levels are uh, as we progress in this course. But for now, just hit yes. It will essentially ensure that SQL map does not use any payloads that might damage uh, the database or the data stored therein or anything. It will not use any malicious SQL payload. So I'll hit yes. All right. So now it's going to test um, in this particular case, MySQL version 5.5 .5 or greater than or equal to 5.5 and error-based uh, payloads. So there we are. And in this case, it looks like the big integer unsigned. So we're going to let this run for a couple of seconds. Now, in certain cases, as you can see here, this is going to take uh, a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes, depending on the tests being run. All right, now, um, there's a better way of speeding this up. All right, and the way you can go about speeding this up is to you know utilize um, the a time second interval or to optimize the scan now by default we can already see that it's done all right so it's uh, right over here it's going to tell us post parameter words exact is um, mysql greater than or equal to 5.5 and error based injectable and SQL map identified the following injection points with a total of 37 HTTP requests. So it ran multiple iterations to identify the correct payload that in this case looks like it's going to display. If we take a look at the payload here, we can see that the payload is um, exact test equals test in Boolean mode and select if select from select concatenate. And these have been um, turned into hex select uh, and there's a utilization of a logical or mathematical operation always set to true. And it's going to extract specific information. All right. Now I'll, I'll explain what this means. But what we can do is just copy the payload here that is provided to you. Again, ending where the payload ends. So before the other injectable parameter, which is words any, we'll copy this here. 
and I'm going to open up a new text file and I am going to save it in here and I'm going to zoom in. All right. So what we can do now is copy this and go back into the web app and into burp suite, sorry, and make sure intercept is on. And we're going to make another request here. And within this particular or the value for this parameter will perform the injection. However, now with the payload provided to us by SQL map. So we'll paste it in. All right. And it is recommended to always URL encode this. So one time URL uh, encode, which is done through uh, the keyboard, uh, keyboard combination control and U. And uh, you can then just hit forward. We'll now take a look at the web application here. And in this particular case, we do get some information. So what information have we got? So in order to identify what info has been dumped here, because uh, SQL map will not tell us that uh, if we take a look at it here and let's take a look at the other results firstly, but we can see that it's error based, right? And the parameter is words exact. It tells us the payload in this case, we're having order by group by clause um, and the payload doesn't tell us what it, what info it displays, but it tells us the web server operating system is Linux Ubuntu. And the web application technology is Apache 2.4.7 and PHP 5.5.9. And the backend DBMS is MySQL 5 uh, greater than or equal to 5.5, not the exact version and nothing else. Now, these string of numbers have been encoded in hexadecimal. This is something that MySQL will typically do, uh, or rather not MySQL, SQL map will typically do uh, to evade uh, detection. So bypass very rudimentary input validation. And the way we can check what each of these means or what each of these hex encoded um, strings or rather pieces of data means is by utilizing Cyberchef. So we can actually convert uh, from hex into clear text. And uh, this is obviously not the correct way of doing it. What we can obviously try and view is what data is uh, being displayed. So we can copy any of these here, for example, uh, like this here. And we can see in this case, it looks like it's just a random string of text. Let's try the other one. Uh, so for example, this one here, and let's see what this means. If we print that out, it looks like the same. And uh, we can then say uh, 0x78. And that refers to a single X. So it's just taking a payload that you might have seen uh, publicly accessible or publicly available on a GitHub repo and just converting it, right? And what we can do in this particular case, if we take a look at the, re uh, the output from the web application, it says it displays exactly that. Select the following string from dual and uh, then, you know, these two operations here, right? And now what we can do is we can modify this particular payload to display info that is useful to us. Now, what type of info might we want? So for example, the type of info we may want is, uh, so after this here, we know that this just displays X, right? Uh, we can utilize the MySQL version command to display the MySQL version. So just version and double quotes. And then we can use the same payload and this should output the version of the MySQL database being used. So uh, go back into uh, Burp Suite and uh, we're going to resend the request. And we're going to replace that particular value there with our own uh, SQL injection payload. And again, make sure we actually um, URL encode this. So there we are one time. And I'm going to forward that request there. We take a look at the results. You can now see that if select, and then we have that string here, it then displays the version of MySQL running on this particular web server. And in this case, it tells us it's 5.5.47 on Ubuntu, which verifies that this info is correct. So uh, as you can see, SQL map is useful, not just for the crazy complex attacks. It's really useful firstly in identifying, uh, payloads that can be used to dump info. And again, as I said, this is tip, the hexadecimal stuff is typically added there uh, to evade detection, which you can also explore. Um, and in this case, you know, you're able to use a tool like Cyberchef to easily uh, decode it or, you know, view it in ASCII. Uh, and in this case, you know, it's just uh, trying to utilize again, where having order by or group by clauses to display information 
And in this case, we're able to get uh, the, my, the version of MySQL running, which it wasn't able to get in and of itself. So that's pretty cool. Let's take a look at what else we can do. So uh, after we've identified the uh, DBMS running, as well as the version of the DBMS, you can take a look at another GitHub repo called Payload All The Things, which most of you should be familiar with if you're a pen tester. And under SQL injection, we have a MySQL injection section or markdown file that will provide you with advanced payloads right over here to identify specific information based on the version of MySQL that's running. So for example, if uh, we have uh, the, if the version of MySQL uh, running is greater than or equal to 5.1, we can utilize these payloads here uh, to try and enumerate information. So for example, uh, if I take a look at some of these here, um, let's see one that matches the one that SQL map utilized. We can see the one that SQL map utilized was something similar to this, but we can try any of them. Um, so let's try this one here. All right. And we may need to modify it, but uh, let's go ahead and try it out. So I'll resend that and we'll intercept it with um, Burp Suite. And I'll paste this in here. And the first thing we want to do is uh, use a single quote there because this is string based injection. And we want to, instead of using the double dash here, we may want to try it out. Uh, we can actually just uh, URL encode that uh, payload, say control U to encode it and we can forward it. Let's see whether this is valid at all. In this particular case, doesn't look like it's working. Um, so if we take a look at it here. It doesn't give us the exact line at line one. So there's an issue with this here. So we may need to redo this again. So I'm just going to again replace this with our payload. And we can say, for example, in here, let's remove these two dashes and use the pound symbol that usually seems to work. We can uh, take that in here and say control U, for example, and forward and uh, doesn't display the version. So again, it's trial and error if you want to go through it manually to find specific information. So this is all error based. We can try some of this. This actually looks similar to what we were doing uh, or the payload that was generated here. So ID equals one. And uh, we would need to say in this particular case and and in this particular case, we don't have a URL parameter. So we might be better using this one here. So let's try this particular payload and uh, we will resubmit and uh, we'll then replace that particular parameter. And by the way, you can test the other parameters. It's entirely up to you. And we will URL encode this once. And there we are for that. Let's take a look at the results here. So it looks like we have uh, an issue with the syntax. I'm going to resend that again and uh, paste this in here. Uh, that looks fine. So words exact, we can actually just put in a string there. So test single quote and update XML. And then in here, sort of using the, we can just use a pound symbol there and uh, then URL encode this. So there we are. And uh, we'll hit forward. And that still doesn't display any information. So it says looks like we have a bit of a issue with our syntax. But yeah, trial and error. Um, I just want to try a couple of them just to see which one is a you know, better chance of working here. Um, let's see, uh, we can also try and extract the data. Uh, but that's really not what we're interested at this point in time. Uh, you can go ahead and take a look at some of these payloads here. I'll now show you how we can utilize a SQL map to dump data uh, from the actual database. And this comes now into the exploitation phase of the vulnerability. So this is typically not what you would do in a bug bounty when you're doing bug bounty hunting, uh, because you're now, you know, extracting info, although, as I said, in the slides, you may be required to do this, if you have been asked to prove the severity of the vulnerability. So you know, proof of concept not being enough. So in this case, we'll just run the previous command here, and we need to change a couple of things. So we're still using error based injection. Uh, what we can do now is list out the current database that is being used or that we have access to, right? And uh, I'll hit enter. And uh, yes, we want to follow the redirect and no, we do not want to resend the original post data. And it, it already has our session saved. 
in this particular case uh, looks like uh, it gives us the payload and not the current DB, which is very interesting. It should actually enumerate that. Uh, current DB, is that displayed here? Uh, yes, it is. Sorry, my bad. So there we are. Fetching the current database, retrieved the database called recipe. So once you've identified the database, that's really good enough. What you can do now is say, okay, uh, the database is called recipes. And I want you to, um, hmm, let's see. I want you to display the tables. So in this case, we'll follow the redirect and no, just follow the same instruction. It's going to fetch the tables for this particular database. So in this case, there we are. We can see all the tables for that database and it lists it out here. So we have these tables within the database. So we have categories, ingredients, recipe ingredients, recipes, sessions, units, and users. Fantastic. So what if we want to dump the data within the users table? Well, what we would do is we would specify the table. So database is recipes, and then the table is called users, and then we can say dump. All right, so uh, yes, follow the redirect. Uh, do we want to resend the original post data? No, we do not. And now it's going to fetch the columns for the table uh, users in the database recipes. And there we are, looks like we're getting the actual columns here. And uh, just going to give it a couple of seconds. Let's see how many user accounts we have. So uh, we're now getting the records themselves. So these were the rows. Second row, there we are. So we have ID, name, email, privileges, password, and the username. So in this case, it looks like we have identified the admin um, account. So username is recipes and the password looks like it is encoded in base64. So if we go into uh, Cyberchef, which is a great online tool, uh, we can um, use it to decode a lot of uh, common encoding uh, algorithms or hashes, if you will. I'll paste that in here. Uh, it doesn't look like it's base64. That's interesting. That just might be the password. That's my bad. Uh, but uh, you know, we can try and log into the site now. So if we go back into the site and I've disabled the intercept feature, we know that the username is recipes. And uh, I'm just showing you the exploitation side of things. So paste in the password, log in, and it says the password is incorrect. So that might be in a hashed format, uh, which means we would need to obviously try and crack this. Uh, it could be in, uh, if we used something like uh, hash identify, hash identifier, put that in there. It tells us that, uh, sorry, let's paste that in here. So it's DES uh, Unix, um, which means uh, we would actually need the secret, uh, which we don't have here, uh, because this is in DS format. Uh, to decrypt DS, you need the actual, um, you need the actual encoded DS string as well as the, uh, the actual secret. So this might not be, um, this might not work that well. So if we go into Cyberchef, you can see we can decrypt it. However, we need the secret key um, and uh, that would allow us to do it. So, um, you know, we would have essentially got the clear text password. And uh, from that point on, we would have been able to log in. Now, there's additional functionality you can perform with SQL map. Um, and that obviously will involve uh, obtaining a system shell. So that's uh, what you typically con uh, consider an out of band SQL injection attack. So if I open up the help menu, you can see that uh, you can uh, utilize operating system access. So these options can be used to access the backend database management system underlying operating system. So the OS shell option will prompt for an interactive operating system shell. So uh, in this particular case, what we would do is we would say, you know, just OS shell. In this case, let's see whether this would work. If we have the correct permissions, um, uh, we should be able to get a shell. So we can try, for example, a PHP shell. Um, yeah, let's try that out. This might not work. Uh, we can go ahead and... Um, uh, let's just perform a, uh, I'm not sure, yeah, let's use, use option one. So access denied. So the user account we have access to 
will be will determine where or what um, directory we can upload the stager to to obtain the shell. So in this case, you can see it's trying to upload to var docs, HTML, etc. Um, and uh, I don't think with any with the user account we currently have access to, we'll be able to upload it to any. Uh, we may be able to do it in the temp directory, uh, which might work. So that might provide us with some form of access. So there we are, it looks like uh, all of these are failing. So I'm just going to wait for this to complete. So there we are. Uh, we can see that that didn't work. So we can try it again, uh, just as a final demonstration. So uh, no. And uh, we can go for PHP. Uh, yes. So full path disclosure. Uh, we can specify a, uh, a custom location. So we can say TMP, for example, the temp directory uh, looks like that is denied. And uh, this might be because obviously, if we go back here and we say SQL map uh, help, we can try and execute and, uh, you know, prompt for an OOB shell, which uh, should work, I think, let's try it out. So OS pawn, let's try that out. Uh, yes, and no. We'll go for the default and yes to provoke the full path disclosure here and we'll use the default option there. So that's going to fail obviously because uh, it's going to try those same directories. Uh, what we can do is identify the current user. All right. So if we go back to the some of the uh, earlier commands we ran here, we can uh, enumerate the current user to see what access we have with regards to the MySQL user account. So in this case, it looks like the current user is recipes at localhost, right? Now, given that that is the case, we could obviously try some testing regarding where we can upload the shell uh, or the stage as it were. Uh, but that's something that we can explore as we proceed on. I just wanted to uh, introduce you to SQL map and show you the uh, crazy stuff that you can do. And of course, test all of this out, all of this functionality here. So for example, you can also enumerate the DBMS user password hashes. We've taken a look at retrieving the current user, current database. Uh, you can also retrieve everything, which will take quite a while, but uh, there you go. So that is going to conclude the practical demonstration side of this video. All right, so that was how to identify and exploit error-based SQL injection vulnerabilities in a real world web application. So. Uh, that was quite a long demo, but it was essential just to show you how robust the testing process can be, the various options you can utilize, the tools you can utilize, what resources to leverage, and of course, SQL map. This is the way I want to teach you how to use it uh, using different use cases and scenarios. Uh, so hopefully uh, that uh, has given you enough of an idea as to what error-based SQL injection looks like from an, an attacker's perspective, we're now going to turn our attention to union based SQL injection, which we'll be exploring in the next video. So with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. Exploiting union based SQL injection vulnerabilities. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how to identify and exploit union-based SQL injection vulnerabilities through a practical example. So this video will have a lab environment attached to it, and we're going to be using it to, again, demonstrate the methodology and the techniques behind uh, union-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. Now, of course, the previous video was quite lengthy, and that's because of the uh, complexity or rather the, the multitude of steps involved in not only identifying and exploiting a SQL injection vulnerability in general, but in that case, an error-based SQL injection vulnerability. So we're going to be utilizing the info from that video and then taking it into here um, and essentially using it where it applies. Now, this may be a little bit confusing to you, but don't worry, everything will make sense. The only thing you need to come into this video knowing is that this is still an in-band SQL injection vulnerability. So. Let's get started by taking a look at this hierarchy tree here. So we've taken a look at error-based SQL injection already. And remember, union-based, which is what we're taking a look at right now, still falls under in-band, right? So I hope you're already familiar with what in-band is. If not, I'll just give you a brief uh, description of it. So an in-band SQL injection vulnerability is where the 
the attacker utilizes the same communication channel to perform the injection and re uh, retrieve the results. So think back to the error-based SQL injection uh, video where we utilized or we found an application input, we injected our payload or SQL query, and we got uh, an output. So don't, don't focus on the what the output was, we just get a response from the database. In in-band SQL injection, the response from the database is uh, performed through the same communication channel. What am I saying here? If you performed the SQL injection uh, attack via an input point on the web application, in in-band SQL injection, the results will be returned typically to the same page and will, the, the data will be uh, returned or displayed on the same page where you performed the injection. Uh, with blind SQL injection, no errors are displayed on the web page where you made the injection. That's why it's called blind, in that you're not aware of whether your query was successfully executed or not. And that's why you have to uh, resort to more heuristic um, base techniques in order to monitor that, like using Booleans. I know you'll actually see what that looks like, as well as time-based SQL injection, where you monitor the uh, time taken by the web page to respond uh, to respond to your query, and that tells you, you know, whether your query was executed successfully. So the point I'm making here is, with error-based, we're essentially using payloads that would invoke an error, and then you know, building from there. And I, you know, we took a look at the exploitation and what we can do with the vulnerability. It's pretty much going to be the same from a, a high-level category perspective, but we're just using a different set of payloads. So this is where the the exploitation technique differs. All right, so. Let me introduce you to union-based SQL injection. I sort of gave you a brief introduction in the uh, uh, the types of SQL injection vulnerabilities video, uh, but let me reintroduce it here. So as the name suggests, union-based SQL injection uh, is a type of SQL in injection attack or vulnerability that exploits the ability to utilize the union operator in the SQL queries. It typically occurs when an application fails to properly validate or sanitize user input and allows an attacker to inject malicious SQL code or queries into the original query being used by the web application to communicate with the database, right? So we've already taken a look at the union operator very briefly in the SQL fundamentals video, and I didn't really cover union-based SQL injection identification in the finding SQL injection vulnerabilities video. And the reason for that will become apparent because identifying them is not really the uh, the thing that you need to know. That's fairly simple based on what we've taken a look at. What we need to know is how to utilize the union operator, which I wanted to uh, essentially pause until this point or until this video and for good reason, because this can be quite complicated and not in a bad way. It essentially means that you need to, you really need to un have an understanding of how specific MySQL databases work with regards to their database schema and what you are essentially doing when you utilize the union operator. So what is the union operator? Well, the union operator is used in the structured query language to combine the results. Keep in mind uh, this particular keyword. So it's used to combine the results of two or more. So two or more select statements into a single result set. And we'll revisit what the select statement is used for, but by this point, you should already know that. So what are the requirements here? Well, it essentially requires that the number of columns and their data types match in the select statements being combined. So you're utilizing two select statements. Let's say, for example, how do you, you how would you uh, get data from two different uh, tables um, and you know specific columns and uh, get the output of those select statements to be displayed uh, in one, right? Or as one, if you will. The way you do that is using the union operator. Union, if you've done mathematics before, if you've done uh, you know Venn diagrams, you know what union means. It's simply used uh, to infer that there's an intersection and uh, there's now a union of uh, in this case, data sets, uh, or in the case of SQL injection, uh, you know, the actual results of two or more data sets. And um, as I said, the key thing here is that it requires the number of columns and their data types match. And if the previous examples, when we were finding SQL injection vulnerabilities, I sort of went over the payloads to use, but I didn't really, we really didn't have much success. And again, that was done on purpose because if I dived into that there, it would have confused pretty much any other sub 
uh, SQL injection vulnerability subtype that we explored. So it's great that we're getting into it right now. So in a union-based SQL injection attack, the attacker injects additional select statements through vulnerable input to retrieve data from other database tables or extract sensitive information. So in other words, we're just changing around the technique we're utilizing to extract data. Now, as I said, once you've verified that a SQL injection vulnerability exists, in the case of, uh, of union-based SQL injection, uh, identifying the impact and severity of the vulnerability will involve you running um, or utilizing the union operator. So uh, this is very, very important because this is a very nuanced uh, type of SQL injection vulnerability. Now, the easiest way to understand this is through the use of this uh, example that will sort of illustrate what's going on. So let's say we have a web application input and it utilizes the following query uh, to interact with the database and you know get whatever data is required or to confirm if a particular user exists, right? So the as you know, in order to retrieve data from a particular uh, from a particular table um, and refer to a particular column with regards to the data that you want uh, for a particular record, what you do is use the select operator which you're already familiar with so we say select and then after that what we need to provide if required is the columns or the attributes we're interested in so we're saying select id and name from the table called users all right so in this case it looks like this may be a, a login query right where we you know the web application wants the id and the name but there's no real password so again just disregard that uh that example or you know uh, the login form example that I just used. So select ID and name from the table called users. And I only want you to display data that matches the following criteria, which is where the ID equals to. And then this is where, or rather, this is the parameter that, uh, you know, or in this particular case, the parameter is called ID. And then the value is where we inject our query, right? Now, as I mentioned previously in other videos, this uh, this particular parameter here, ID equals, or it can be name equals, is data type um, specific in that if this if the SQL query utilizes you know two single quotes or two double quotes, then that means it's treated as a string. And if you wanted to perform your injection, you would essentially utilize a single quote to um, terminate the string literal and then pass in your query after that. So an attacker can exploit this vulnerability by injecting a union-based attack payload into the user input parameter. It's really the value of the parameter, but just uh, for the sake of conversation, uh, they could inject a statement like, uh, so they use in this case a single, um, a single quote uh, right over here to terminate the string literal and then start their own um, their own SQL query. So it's not really terminating the previous one, it's just saying in addition to that query, I also want you to run this one. And in this case, we're saying, uh, in addition to running this select query, I also want you to run the following. So union select, and in this case, um, the, uh, the columns being referred to here are credit card number and hack from the table credit card. So you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm a little bit confused here because you're now referencing a different set of columns in a different table. And that's exactly the core or the crux of union-based SQL injection is because you're already working or you can leverage this very query here uh, to extract info from the users table using something like a Boolean based payload where, where we could say quote, single quote, or one equals one and you know use the comment, um, the comment symbol based on the uh, relational database management system being used that would essentially display all values for this particular um, for this particular table or all records in the users table when you talk about union based SQL injection is very powerful because you can now say okay I also want to get data from another table now the problem here is that if you're targeting a real world web application firstly you don't know really what table this query is interacting with or you don't know the name of the table secondly you don't know the names of any other tables and the columns that they have within that table so this is where the whole idea of um the whole idea of performing 
uh, database enumeration and enumerating the database schema comes into play. And we'll talk a little bit about this in the practical section. So the injected payload modifies the original query to retrieve the credit card numbers along with a custom value called hack from the credit cards table. All right, uh, actually in this, yeah, from the credit cards uh, table, the double dash at the end is used to comment out the remaining part of the original query. All right, so very simple to understand, but the key thing is how do we know that there is a table called credit card number, or sorry, there is a table called credit cards, and that table has the columns credit card number and you know particular value called hack, right? So if the application is vulnerable to union-based SQL injection, the modified query would become the following. So select ID uh, and name from the table users where the ID equals, and then you know we use the single quote there, and then we say union select credit card number and hack from credit cards, and then we use the double dash to infer a uh, you know essentially to act as a comment and end the query there if anything follows after that. Now this uh, comment symbol or the uh, the way you specify comments will differ based on the type of MySQL database you are utilizing, sorry, the type of SQL database you're using specifically. So in the case of MySQL, you're able to see through the practical examples that the pound symbol or the hash symbol typically worked. And that's not um, that's not a mistake, that's by design. In some other SQL databases, you'll typically see that the double dash works, all right? And in the um, Finding SQL Injection Vulnerabilities video, there is a slide that gives you an example of what comment, um, comment symbols or characters to use based on the type of SQL database you are targeting. All right, so the database would then execute this modified query and the result would include the credit card numbers alongside the original user data and the attacker can subsequently extract this sensitive information. So what is the methodology of identifying and exploiting union-based SQL injection vulnerabilities? So number one, as we saw in the previous uh, video, identify user inputs. So determine the inputs on the application that are used in database queries or that interact with the database. These inputs can include URL parameters, form fields, cookies, or any other user controllable data. Secondly, test inputs for the actual vulnerability. This is done through the use of a, the injection of a simple payload, such as a single quote or a double quote. If the application produces an error or exhibits unexpected behavior, it may or it might indicate a potential SQL injection vulnerability. Thirdly, identify vulnerable in injection points. So this involves manipulating the injected payload to check if the application responds differently based on the injected data. This is specific to union-based injection. So in other words, you can try injecting various payloads like or typically union select statements or Boolean conditions, for example, or one equals one, or see if the application or to see if the application behaves differently based on the response. And then fourthly, confirm the presence of a vulnerability. Once you've identified a potential injection point, you need to confirm if it is, um, you know, you need to confirm that it is vulnerable to union-based SQL injection. To do this, you can inject union select statement and observe the application's response. If the application includes additional columns or unexpected data, it is likely vulnerable to union-based SQL injection. And lastly, enumerate the database. And this is also what we'll be touching on in order, uh, you can exploit the union-based SQL injection vulnerability to enumerate the database structure, inject union select statements with the appropriate column names and the table names to retrieve information about the database schema. We'll be touching on that as well. Uh, database schema, tables and columns. And you can utilize techniques like order by or limit clauses to retrieve specific information. With that being said, uh, this brings us to the practical demo. So as I said in the um, in the beginning of this video, this uh, this video has a lab environment attached to it. The lab environment is a real world web application, but much simpler in terms of complexity, and that's for good reason. This lab environment will also provide you with your own Kali Linux box or system, so you don't have to use your own, which is great. You can access it directly via your browser. We'll not be utilizing any specialized tools or automated tools like SQL Map, and again, you'll see why. So with that being said, I'm going to start up the lab environment and uh, I'll see you there. All right, so I'm currently back or I'm currently within the lab environment. And as you can see, you'll be provided with a Kali Linux system. 
and a Firefox window will be automatically open for you. That'll direct you to a web application called exam results. All right. And the URL is results.abc.university.edu. And it looks like the web server is running on port 5000. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be utilizing primarily manual techniques here. I'm just going to zoom into the point where you can see th uh, things clearly. And uh, the web application is very, very simple, right? It essentially asks us to enter your roll number, right? And or that would typically mean your enrollment number. Now, this is data that obviously as a pen tester or a bug bounty hunter, you're not going to be privy to. OK, so we can enter data like, uh, let's say, 100 or something random to see whether it matches. And typically with web applications like this, where the you know information like a roll number is going to be unique, uh, unless you know a student who goes to the university, for example, you it'll be very difficult to guess what type of system they're using, what type of numbering system they're using. Is it random? Is it order based? And if it is order based, at what point does it start? Because it could start at, you know, 10, uh, 100, 1000, etc. So let's, you know, enter this in here. And what do we get? All right, so it says result for 100 and it displays uh, the date. It looks like the web application by design will interact with the database and display the data uh, in the form of columns. So roll number is one column. That's the enrollment number, the name of the student, their marks and their rank, which makes sense because this is an exam results portal. So in terms of identification, there's multiple ways we can go about doing this. The first thing we need to identify, and this is extremely manual and blind, or however, don't confuse this with blind SQL injection, but um, what we need to do is identify firstly whether this value here is being treated as a string or integer. All right, and the way we can do that is by utilizing a web proxy, and this is the only uh, time we'll use it, but we'll go into Burp Suite. Uh, you should have Foxy Proxy enabled as an extension in Firefox and the Burp Suite proxy configured for Firefox here. What that means is that once you select Burp Suite, it'll proxy all the traffic from this particular browser into Burp Suite. And uh, we can access Burp Suite by opening up the Kali menu here and going into Web Application Analysis and Burp Suite. This is obviously an older version of Burp Suite, but again, works exactly the same. We'll start a temporary project and start that up here. And uh, there we go. So it's going to fire up um, Burp Suite. And we want to navigate or I'm just going to maximize this and go into the proxy right over here. And actually, what I'm also going to do in this particular case is increase the font size. So under display, the user interface, we can change that to something like 18. And that will need us to restart it, but I don't think we need to do that. And the font size for the HTTP message, we'll go into proxy, make sure the intercept is set to on, and we'll go into the web application and we'll click on get result. All right, so in this particular case, we can see that the, uh, the data is being passed in the URL, right, as a parameter. In this case, the parameter name is roll number and that's equals to 100. Now, the reason you don't see this here is down to how the web application is built, where the URL or any parameters are not displayed publicly, which is a great thing that de web developers do to sort of mask how the web application works. But obviously, this information can be, uh, you know, can be inferred. However, it's not really referring to this web server because the host is the IP of the target, but port 8000. All right. Now, that's not really important in this case, but you can see that the referrer, we're able to confirm that because the referrer is the actual site we're targeting where the injection is made. So results.abc.university.edu. The point I'm making is that this parameter is being sent to this particular web server here. Now, it could be the same web server, but just a different service running. In this case, it is a web server because you can see HTTP and the port is 8000. So we could potentially try and access this in a browser and see what happens. So I'll just say copy and forward this and make sure intercept is off just to see what we get here, whether you know we have a public interface. Yeah, there we are. It looks like a particular API or something that then interacts with the database for us. So again, the complexity really doesn't matter. The only thing you need to understand is that this information is being sent from here, from results.abc.university.edu, 
to another service, in this case, what appears to be an API or an endpoint that then interacts with the database based on the value of the parameter you've specified and then returns the data back here or on results.abc.university.edu. So if we click on get results again, you can see that here. All right, now this still doesn't tell us whether we're dealing with string based, uh, a string based parameter or an integer parameter. And again, you never want to rely on the fact that the data being requested to be input by the use of the web application legitimately, uh, you never want to consider the data, the actual data type because a, an integer can still be passed uh, in as a string via the query itself, right? So the easiest test we can perform, and I can go ahead and shut down the uh, shut down burp suite here because we really don't need it in this particular case. Uh, let me just uh, shut that down here and I'll make sure that this is we turn off the burp suite profile for Foxy Proxy there. Uh, looks like burp suite isn't terminating here. So let me just shut this down. All right, so I got that shut down. So we can try for a, a simple uh, test, right? And that is using a single quote right over here. And we hit get result. Now we're not getting any errors, which is a little bit strange. You know, we can try a double quote or something like that or say, you know, that doesn't seem to work. But we can try a Boolean operation like... Um, single quote or one equals one and let's use the pound symbol if it is my sequel we should get pretty much all of the um we should get all the roll numbers and names and marks of and ranks of all students so if i hit get result okay something happens but we don't get anything because it says uh, results uh for single quote or one equals one but we really don't get anything um, so what if we try and change this to the SQL uh, delimiter here? So that is the semicolon and hit enter. Okay, nothing. So what if we're dealing with something like a PostgreSQL or SQLite uh, database, a relational database? Well, in that case, we can try the double dashes or the double hyphen there and click on get results. All right, fantastic. So number one, we've identified an application input. Secondly, we've, we've confirmed that it is vulnerable to SQL injection and we've been able to get data, you know, all of the records from this particular table. But remember, we still don't know what table this is. We just know that it, you know, the, the columns within it that at, at least are being referenced by the query are roll number, name, marks and rank. And it looks like uh, uh, Rohan Singh here has the highest marks or rather actually no, uh, Rahul Verma looks to be, no, actually, sorry, that's uh, Amulia here uh, because their rank is uh, set to one. All right, and that brings me to my first example. Um, and uh, that is how to utilize the order by, uh, the order by statement. And, uh, you know, the way we would typically inject this is fairly simple to understand. It, you know, we have a logical statement here, uh, but uh, what we could do is say, for example, you know, order by one. So we can say order by one. And we know that we're most likely dealing with a SQL like database here. So we'll say get results. Okay. And we could say or uh, one equals one. And uh, we can also say and order by one get results. Okay, that doesn't work. Um, if we try and say, in this particular case, what we could do is utilize a comment there and say get results. In this case, it doesn't look like it's uh, going through the uh, the order that we want. But the way this works, uh, when we utilize the order by statement or clause, um, what it does is it uh, increments the specified column index until uh, you know we get errors. So the point here is that. Um, you know, if we go ahead and say order by, let's say, uh, order by five, for example, and hit get results, we don't get anything in here or any other errors, say get results, etc. But let's get rid of this here, because I don't want any data stored there. So the the point here, and I probably should have explained this is the reason we're using numerical values here, like order by six is referring to the actual column number because columns have numbers, right? So what we I was saying we could do, and we'll get to this shortly, we could say, or, you know, uh, one equals one, and then we have double comment there. And then we can say, um, in this particular case, 
order by and then the, the, the actual column. In this case, we don't know the column numbers, but we could specify the name. So for example, order by name. And uh, we then specify whether, you know, we want it ascending. So we could just say by the name, display it in ascending order. And uh, did that change anything? I don't think so. So we could say, um, let's get rid of this here. Um, let's just see whether that changes anything. So one equals one. Um, let us display that here. So there we are. So now it sorts that out, right? But this is not really union based. I'm just giving you an, you know, an example of some of the queries we weren't able to practically see the results of. So we could also do that to, you know, for example, rank, which would make sense if we wanted to see who is ranked first. We could do that here and we can see that Amulia, Shivam, Puneet uh, and their relevant marks. And, you know, we could then filter by their data type. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, firstly, we're leveraging the original select statement, which looks like it's getting the following columns or it's referencing the following. So it's saying select. Uh, roll number, name, marks, and rank from, we don't know whether those are there, it actually looks like these are the original uh, column names, but we're saying select these columns uh, or select from these columns where, um, or select these columns from the table where, you know, the actual roll number is equal to, but we're utilizing the single quote and saying, okay, uh, or one equals one, which is always true. And that's going to display every record in this particular table. And we're also saying for that same set of results, I want you to order this by rank or the column and the uh, the ordering is in ascending order. So hopefully that makes sense. But as I said, this is still not union based SQL injection. Now, in order to perform union based SQL injection correctly, we obviously know that we have one, two, three, four columns that are visible here. But these are not an accurate representation, uh, representation of the total number of columns within the table that we are referencing or the queries referencing here. So how do we go about finding these particular, uh, how do we go about identifying how many columns exist within this particular table that we currently have access to? Well, the way we could do that is by utilizing the union operator here and saying union and saying select, and then we utilize column numbers. So we can say union select. And if, if this works, or when it starts working, uh, it'll actually display the relevant column numbers. All right, so we can say union select one, and we'll add a comment there and say get result. Okay, nothing is listed here. So what do we do next? The next thing we do is we increment this value here. We say two. Okay, nothing displayed here. We say three, are they three columns? We know they are three, but the order or the, the actual number for each of these columns is not listed. When we hit a, an accurate match of the correct number of columns within this table, we'll actually see those numbers juxtaposed in the, in the actual uh, columns, their respective columns. So I'll say get results here, nothing. Um, so we, we know that we have four, that's uh, what is being displayed here, but there could be more. So we'll say get results, uh, how about five? Are we, uh, do we have a table or sorry, a column that's not being displayed publicly here? We could, if we say get result, boom, there we go. So we can see, and this is very important. We have columns. We have a column called roll number, which has a column number of one, which means in the table, this would come first. However, we can see that we don't have a column called two that is displayed publicly on the web application. We're just checking the order. We can see that name, the column name is column three in the table and marks is column four and rank is column five. All right. Now, what that means essentially uh, from a union based SQL injection vulnerability is we can leverage any of these columns that are listed here, specifically their numbers. We can use any of them to inject or to select another or other data from another uh, table, right? And I'll actually show you what that looks like. We just need to specify what column we want to inject or what column we want to display that data from another, uh, from another table. And this is very important. So I know that might, that might be confusing. What we're doing here is, and this is a manual technique that's typically done, is we're essentially saying, union select and the select um the select 
operator in this case is being used to identify the the actual column numbers. Now the web application by design only wants the end user or the use of this web application to see uh, these four columns. But based on the numbering here, we can see that there are five columns. We just know that from this particular table, whose name we don't know, column two or the values in column two are not being displayed by the web application. So just keep that in mind. What that means is that this column here, column two is non-injectable, which means we cannot take any data using the union select command or query. We cannot take data any from any other table and inject it in here. Because remember, going back to the definition of union-based SQL injection, we're utilizing uh, the union operator to combine the results of two or you know, two or more select statements. So one select statement is already being used by the query that essentially displays this info. And then we're using a second, in this case, uh, we're utilizing a second union select statement that just says, okay, within the same table, can you just display this info here? And we're doing this to identify what we can and cannot do with regards to displaying data from other tables in this particular table. And the reason for that is because the number of columns have to match. And that's why we're running into these issues in the finding SQL injection vulnerabilities uh, video when we are taking a look at those payloads. So hopefully it makes sense now. Now the question is, we don't know the values or we don't know the names of any other tables within this database. We don't know what columns they have or the names of the columns or anything else. The only thing we know is that we have access to a table here and uh, this table has five columns, one of which uh, we cannot see its actual name. So how do we go about firstly, identifying what uh, SQL database or um, DBMS we are currently interacting with. And that is very important because it'll allow us to choose the payloads we use specifically uh, to you know, extract info from the database schema and learn more about the other tables uh, within the database. So uh, based on that info, we're, I'm already pretty sure that we're dealing with a SQLite database. All right, now given that that is the case, let me switch over to another browser window where I have one of those GitHub repositories that contains database uh, specific queries that you can run during SQL injection. So let me just switch over for a second. All right, so I'm currently on a GitHub repo called Payload All The Things, and I've already shown you this. So under SQL injection, you can see that there's different payloads for different types of SQL databases. So we have MSSQL, MySQL, which we're familiar with, and then we have SQLite. All right, now in here, you can see that SQLite comments are typically defined or denoted by the double hyphen or the double dash or a forward slash uh, asterisk asterisk forward slash. In order to get the SQLite version, we just need to say select SQLite. So we need to utilize a select uh, operator statement. So let's try that out. All right, so I'm back in the lab and we're going to use that info here. Now you may be asking yourself, well, how do we use this info? Well, the first thing you need to know is that that data is does not exist in this particular table, but we, we can utilize the union select operator and our knowledge of columns or the column numbers to essentially display it or display the version in a particular uh, in a particular column here. So the way we can do that is firstly identify what columns are visible publicly. In this case, we know one, three, four, and five. So that means we can inject into any uh, into any one of them and have that data displayed here. So let's try it out. So we can do this, for example, in um, column one, which is injectable. We can do that by just saying SQLite uh, version. So the the actual command or uh, query displayed on the GitHub repo and make sure to include the double uh, brackets here. And uh, that's pretty much all that we need to do. So I'll hit get result. And at the bottom, you can now see in column one, which is roll number, the uh, the SQLite version is displayed here. So that actually validates union SQL injection or union based SQL injection. We can see it's 322 dot zero and then the other column numbers. Now the way it's displayed may be a little bit confusing, but don't worry, that typically happens when you're dealing with in-band SQL injection because the web application will determine how it's displayed. The point I'm making here is that it's displaying it last because firstly, it doesn't match any of the other data types or any of the, uh, the other records and it's a new value. 
um, because you know it's not been added to that particular table, but we're just combining the results of one table, which is this one here, and we're combining uh, we're combining it with another value, not really another table, but another piece of information, and we're injecting it into the first column. So hopefully that makes sense, and you can now get an idea of what else we can do. So we've identified and confirmed that it's a SQLite database, right? And the reason why this is important is because in order to enumerate the uh, database schema, you need to know what database you're working with. So I'm just going to switch over to another browser here or another browser tab to show you the SQLite schema um, and uh, you know what commands we can reference to get specific information. All right, so I'm currently on the SQLite schema table uh, documentation page. So if we go through the introduction really quickly, you can see that every SQLite or uh, uh, every SQLite database, or rather every My uh, SQL database, even MySQL, PostgreSQL, etc., they all contain a single schema table. All right, so what is a schema table? A schema table stores the schema for for that database. The schema for a database is a description of all of the other tables, indexes, triggers, and views that are contained within the database. So hopefully now you should start to see why we always, uh, you know, perform database schema enumeration is so we can learn the names of other tables, uh, the, the, the columns within, etc. Now, in the case, what we want to find out in the case of um, SQLite is what the schema table name is. In this particular case, it looks like it is either SQLite master, SQLite temp schema or SQLite temp master. All right. And it says that the alternatives, which is two and three, only work for the temp database associated with each database connection. But alternative one works anywhere. So this is what we want to use to get info uh, regarding other tables. So we'll actually use that right now. Now, the interpretation of the schema table. Firstly, we have type, right? So the SQLite schema type column will be one of the following text strings, table, index, view, or trigger, according to the type of object defined. The table string is used for both ordinary and virtual tables. We then have the name. So the SQLite schema.name column will hold the name of the object. So that's as far as I'll describe that there. But then we have another, um, we then have another fields, uh, another field, sorry, and that is the table name, all right? So the SQLite, uh, schema.table name column holds the name of a table or view that the object is associated with. For a table of view, the table name column is a copy of the name column. And you'll actually see this and how it works. The other one that's important is the SQL, um, the SQL field. So the SQLite schema.sql column stores SQL text that describes the object. So it'll essentially tell you uh, in the, I'll just go by this description. This SQL text is a create table, create virtual table, create index, create view, or create trigger statement that if evaluated against the database file, when it is the main database of a database connection, would recreate the object. In essence, it tells you, uh, it essentially will, will tell you what commands were used to create specific tables. And that can tell us the other tables um, the other tables within the system, but that can be, you know, inferred using the table name uh, co column or uh, or field. So you may be a little bit confused. Don't worry. This will make sense in a couple of seconds. So I'm going to switch back over into the lab environment, and I'm back. So what does this mean? Well, what if we wanted, for example, to display or to get the um, the names of tables in the actual um, from the actual SQLite master database scheme or schema, sorry. The way we could do that is again, just using the same statement. So or one equals one union select. However, now what we do is, is we say union select. And again, you can put this anywhere you want. So either in column one, not column two, but column three, four and five, we can say we want to get the field table name. So table name, and uh, and I'm, I've got that from the SQLite documentation page where they that we just took a look at. And now we need to select where we're getting this from. And in this case, we're referring to the database schema table, which in the, in the case of SQLite databases is called SQLite master. All right. 
So we're saying essentially union select table name and we want that injected into uh, into column one um, from SQLite master and we hit get result and there we go. So we can see that we have results, which is the table we are currently working in. That's results right over here. And we have another table called secret flag. And that's uh, really the objective of this lab is to obtain that secret flag. So we know that there are two tables really within the database. They could be more, but we know that we're currently interacting or operating or this data right over here, role number, name, marks and rank is the results table that the web application uh, essentially interacts with via the, the query or the query that precedes this single quote right over here. So what else can we enumerate? Well, it would be wise to utilize the SQL field to sort of see uh, or to try and identify the columns within each of these uh, within each of these tables. Now we already know the columns within um, the results table, but the secret flag is the one we need because if we if we are to extract info from this table, we need to know the columns store the, the columns within that table. The way we would do this is utilize instead of table name here, and in this case, let's try something different. I'll inject it into three. All right, I can say in here we can reference the SQL field uh, from the database schema and say uh, from SQLite master. And for each of the tables, it'll show us what SQL query that was used to create that particular um, uh, that particular table and the columns that were created. So I'll hit get result. And there we are. So we can see that uh, right over here, we injected it into column three, uh, right? So one, two and three is where we put SQL. We have create table results and within the results uh, results table, we have the column roll number we don't have primary key and that's why uh, column two was not displayed publicly and that's why it's not injectable because it will not be displayed publicly uh, and this would not be an in-band SQL injection attack. We then have uh, email text or sorry in this case email text uh, it also looks like that was not uh, displayed as well. Uh, we then have the name which is what which is actually displayed here we have marks which is displayed and rank, but it looks like, um, sorry, uh, roll number is the primary key, my bad. What is not displayed is email text. The email text column is not displayed publicly, which means it's not injectable. I do apologize for that. Roll number is obviously the primary key that is used for referencing. Now for the other table called secret flag, we can see that it only has two columns. It has flag and value and they're both text in terms of their data type. So what does this mean? It means that within any of these columns here that are injectable, we can get uh, their values uh, from the secret flag table. So what we would need to do, and I'll just uh, write it uh, from, uh, I'll just write it fresh, is we can say uh, select flag. So this would be column one. We could say select flag and then two, which is not injectable, and then we would now specify um, this uh, this column here. So we've selected column one, which is flag. And we're saying select flag and value from, and uh, we would then say four and five for the other columns. And um, we would say from the table called secret um, underscore flag and use the double comment and we hit get result. And at the bottom here, you can see we're able to get those two columns or the data from that table limited to two columns uh, injected into the um, the columns from the original table, which was the results table that we're currently working in. Now, the reason why you would get errors like the columns do not match is when you try and uh, select columns from another table uh, that are either too many, typically too many, or do not match the um, the number of columns in the table that you're performing the injection in, right? So in, for example, in this case, the only injectable columns here uh, were four, right? Realistically speaking, because column two is not injectable or, and is not being displayed. Uh, and if we, we could inject, uh, you know, uh, flag and value or the flag and value columns into, you know, column two, but it will not be displayed and therefore we will not be able to see that, right? And that's why we are doing it in columns that are publicly displayed. So what we've done is we've essentially just said, okay, uh, can you please get the 
can you please display or get all values from the column called flag and value in the table called secret flag? And we're using union to say, I want you to display them uh, in this in the results table um, or to essentially, you know, display or perform to display everything within the results table and then also add this uh, these two columns or, you know, however many records within that table, just display the two columns from the secret flag uh, table. So again, a bit confusing, but very simple to understand. And, you know, we just hit get result. And again, we can always change this around. We can say, you know, we can say select and we can leave column one as it is. Column three is we can change to value and we can also just say um, column four is where we can put in the flag column and we can hit enter and in this case you can see the the order is changed where we have the um flag and then you know the actual um uh the actual value of the flag right over here and uh, you can see how that works so the just to summarize and i think this is quite important uh, you may be a little bit confused with regards to how union works, but the main error that you'll typically as a, as a, you'll typically see, as I said, is the fact that you know you have an existing table that you're currently interacting with via the query that you've just performed the injection on, and we're able to see those columns, um, the columns and the column numbers, you know, through the initial uh, union select uh, SQL payload that we used that essentially showed their numbers. We saw that uh, there are five columns and uh, pretty much four out of five of them are being publicly displayed, which is what we wanted to know, right? Once we identified that, we knew that any one of these columns is injectable with regards to combining uh, the results uh, you know, of another select statement in here or getting values and then juxtaposing them against uh, this particular results that we already have here. So we already know that at that point, the only then the next step, of course, was to utilize database specific or SQL database specific information uh, regarding the database uh, schema. Um, and, uh, you know, in this case, we knew it was a SQLite database and we, we took a look at their documentation page to learn about, you know, what the name of the database schema is. In this case, we knew, you know, it's, uh, it's called um, SQLite master. And uh, we were then able to extract information from there, like, you know, the, the tables within the database. We found that there was a table called results and uh, in this particular case, secret flag. And we also saw the uh, the columns within each of those tables. And uh, from that, we were able to say, OK, uh, you can run the, the first query. Uh, the first union select query that, uh, you know, essentially gets data or references data from the results table and publicly displays four out of the five columns. We know that that is inf important, but we also want to combine this or the results uh, of that initial select query with this select query where we are essentially going to inject the values uh, of um, the columns value and flag from the secret flag table in here and we then get the data there so if there are multiple records that info would be juxtaposed in different uh, rows here or as different records so it doesn't have to match it doesn't have to be an exact match where you know you uh if you if you want to combine it with um you know the uh if you, you don't need an exact match where you you combine two columns with two columns you just need to ensure that the second union select or the other table you're trying to get data from you're, you're only referencing, uh, you know, columns that can fit uh, within the uh, the actual columns or the results of the initial uh, of the initial select query. So, as I said, when I refer to the initial select query, I'm referring to the query that is being used by the web application to uh, essentially access data from the results table. And in this case, it looks like it's referencing the role number uh, primarily, or it's utilizing the role number value that the user inputs and then displaying the information or other columns like the name, marks and rank. What we're doing is we're just saying, OK, we know that there are four columns here. Uh, second column is not displayed and therefore not injectable in that it will not display the results publicly or on this web application. And we're saying, OK, we can combine the results or the data from another table uh, within this particular table here. And that's exactly what we've done. And the process through which we have arrived here 
uh, as you know, has been very, very manual. So hopefully uh, all of this makes sense. And that is going to conclude the practical demonstration side of this video. All right, so that is union-based SQL injection in a nutshell. I know that was uh, a little bit confusing, but hopefully you understood what was going on. And uh, the lab that we just took a look at did a great job or you know, was set up uh, to demonstrate this exactly. And I think it, you know, gives you that visual understanding of what's going on with regards to matching column numbers or, you know, data from other tables uh, with regards to having the data correctly juxtaposed against, you know, the results uh, or the number of columns in the, uh, that's being referenced from the table being used in the initial select statement. So, you know, just uh, understanding that, you know, you, you typically have a web application that is running, uh, you know, a particular query, uh, typically a select query, and that's getting specific data. Well, all you're doing is just injecting another select statement after that using the union operator to say, okay, you can get this data from the, um, from this select query, that's no problem. That's why we utilized the Boolean payload there where we said one equals one, which means that operation will run just fine. And we're saying in addition to that, can you also combine these results with this uh, or with data from another table and you then specify where you want them injected or in what column you want them injected. And as you saw, uh, we were able to do that. Uh, and we also took a look at, you know, database, uh, enumerating information from the database schema. And that, as I said, is very nuanced and very specific to the uh, SQL database that you are currently interacting with. So always keep that in mind and always check the documentation. Of course, I highlighted this information uh, with regards to the comments uh, uh, or how to add a comment uh, in the finding SQL injection vulnerabilities video, but you can always re refer back to that. Uh, with that being said, we're now going to turn our attention to the next section of the course where we'll be taking a look at uh, blind SQL injection and we'll be starting off uh, with Boolean based SQL injection, which as you've already been able to tell, we've already covered uh, quite a lot. So we'll be taking a look at a much more uh, much more complex web app uh, with regards to how it works, uh, but you'll sort of get the gist uh, as to what, you know, Boolean or in this case, blind SQL injection is all about. So with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. Introduction to Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. So welcome everyone to the blind SQL injection vulnerability section of this course. In the previous section, we took a look at in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities. We're now turning our attention to blind SQL injection vulnerabilities and their uh, respective subtypes. The first of which is Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. All right, so these are some of my favorite, given the fact that they require a lot of manual testing, uh, specifically with regards to the identification. So in this video, I'm going to be uh, reintroducing you to blind SQL injection vulnerabilities uh, because I gave you a brief introduction in the uh, types of SQL injection vulnerabilities video. However, you may have already forgotten the difference between error-based or in-band SQL injection and uh, blind SQL injection vulnerabilities with regards to how they operate and what the differences are. So to begin with, uh, let's revisit the SQL injection uh, types and subtypes hierarchy tree. So in the previous section, we took a look at in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities and the respective subtypes, one of which being error-based SQL injection and union-based SQL injection. We are now turning our attention to blind SQL injection, and we're starting off with Boolean-based SQL injection, and uh, we're then going to be turning our attention to time-based SQL injection uh, within this same section. So we'll start off with this intro uh, video, which will also, which will actually have a lab where we'll be taking a look at the most uh, popular technique that we've already explored, but there's a good reason why I'm doing this with regards to Boolean-based SQL injection. And then there's going to be a follow-up uh, video uh, still tied to Boolean-based SQL injection where I'll highlight uh, some of the manual techniques that can not only be used to identify uh, Boolean-based SQL injection vulnerabilities, but also how to use the vulnerability to extract information about the database. So to begin with, what is blind SQL injection? 
Blind SQL injection is a type of SQL injection attack or vulnerability where an, an attacker can exploit a vulnerability in a web application that does not directly reveal information about the database or the results of the injected SQL query. So if you put this in direct comparison to in-band SQL injection or in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities, the difference here is that the payloads might be the same. They operate slightly differently, you know, based on the fact that it's blind, but in uh, in-band SQL injection, the commonality is that when you inject an SQL query, regardless of whether it is legitimate or malicious, the response of the query is displayed via the same communication channel or on the, the actual page where you performed the injection. So if we again revisit error-based SQL injection, when we utilize the single quote to terminate the string literal and cause an error in the SQL query, we would get an, uh, an actual error from the uh, respective DBMS system. So for example, MySQL would tell us there's, there was an issue in our syntax, and that would confirm the existence of the SQL injection vulnerability. Now, this is where blind SQL injection vulnerabilities come into play, because in certain cases, and even in the, ca you know, in the case of modern web applications, a single quote or putting in a single quote to try and invoke an error will not work in that you may not get an error, you know, uh, therefore confirming that a SQL injection vulnerability exists. And from that point onwards, you may say to yourself, hey, uh, I don't think the, uh, a SQL injection vulnerability exists within this application input. However, you would be wrong if you skipped through the process of testing it for blind SQL injection vulnerabilities. So in this type of attack or vulnerability, the attacker injects malicious SQL code as you would with any SQL injection attack. They inject malicious SQL code or queries into an application's input field. However, the application does not return any useful information or error message uh, or error messages to the attacker in the response. And this is, you know, where a lot of people get confused. And the reason they get confused is, okay, how am I how am I to even identify or tell that an application input or a web application in general is indeed vulnerable to a SQL injection vulnerability if I can't even test and confirm that a vulnerability exists because no error or nothing is, uh, is returned to me? Well, uh, the way the counter or the technique uh, that is used in this case is either going to be Boolean-based SQL injection or time-based SQL injection. And how do these techniques or sub techniques differ from the in band counterparts? Well, they differ because you're not really looking for errors now, or you're not looking for the results of your query to be displayed on the actual page where you made the injection. What you're looking for is a change in the web application's response or how it responds to the injected SQL query. All right. And uh, this is very, very important because Again, if you get too caught up in error-based SQL injection, what you'll typically do is go ahead and in, uh, insert or inje inject a single quote to try and in, uh, infer an error from the database, therefore confirming a SQL injection vulnerability. However, if you don't see that, you may say to yourself, hey, this doesn't look vulnerable to SQL injection. And uh, again, as I said, you would be remiss uh, or I would be remiss if I told you that you should that, you know, skip over that application input because uh, no SQL injection vulnerability exists. My point is that instead of looking for errors, you should look for changes in the web application's behavior based on what you input or what you inject. And again, that can seem a little bit confusing. So don't worry, this will all become simpler to understand when we take a look at the uh, the practical lab in this particular video. So the, attack, the attacker will typically utilize various techniques to infer information about the database, such as time delays when we talk about time-based SQL injection or Boolean logic. So the attacker may inject SQL code that causes the application to delay in the case of time-based SQL injection for a specified amount of time, depending on the result of a query, or they could utilize Boolean-based injection or logical operators to try and uh, to try and get a response that then you know uh, affects how the web application responds in minute ways, and this is one of the things that I really want you to focus on because web applications will uh, will um, will essentially respond to these types of uh, boolean based SQL injection payloads in different ways. So you have to be really keen uh, in in order to 
either confirm that a SQL injection vulnerability exists or, you know, essentially prove that one doesn't exist. And the way you do this is, as I said, through manual techniques. Now, once you've identified that a blind SQL injection vulnerability exists, from that point on, you can bring in a tool like SQL Map, which can assist you with extract uh, the extraction or exploitation of the vulnerability uh, through an out-of-band channel or exfiltration channel, if that makes any sense. All right, so as I've mentioned previously, blind SQL injection can be further divided or subdivided into two subtypes or exploitation techniques. Number one, the one we're exploring right now and in the next video is Boolean-based SQL injection. So in this type of SQL injection attack, the attacker exploits the application's response. That's the key word here. It exploits the application's response to Boolean conditions to infer information about the database. The attacker sends a malicious SQL query to the web application and evaluates the response based on whether the query executed successfully or failed. So the point is that a web application will respond differently if the SQL query was injected successfully and will respond differently if it wasn't injected successfully. So the key thing here is monitoring the application's response. And as I said, this is very, very, very nuanced. However, it's simple to understand. Once you get the hang of it, it'll be very easy to either confirm or deny, you know, as to whether a SQL injection vulnerability exists within that application input. The second subtype that we'll be exploring in this section as well is time-based uh, SQL injection. And this is very easy to understand, uh, primarily because it only involves a modification of the uh, SQL query or payload you're using to, inv to include a, a time-based operation that will tell the database uh, to delay the execution of the query uh, for a specific amount of time. So my point being is if I generate an SQL query telling the, the database that uh, I want you to inject this uh, after five seconds or I want you to inject it and then uh, to sleep for five seconds, I can then monitor the response of the web application. And if it responds after five seconds, I know that the injection was successful. The reason I know that is because web applications don't take five seconds to uh, respond to, uh, to a request, typically speaking, as we saw with Burp Suite when we were monitoring the response in the repeater. So you're essentially just trying to find or to confirm whether the SQL query was injected successfully and you're utilizing time-based uh, time-based operations that are native to the structured query language to say, okay, uh, I'll know that this was injected successfully if uh, there is a delay of 10 seconds. And you can customize that based on your requirements. And I really like blind based SQL injection, um, you know, for these very reasons, because it really is uh, quite interesting and is always dynamic because each web application will respond differently, specifically in the case of, uh, in the case of Boolean based SQL injection. So this brings us to Boolean-based SQL injection. What is Boolean-based SQL injection? Boolean-based SQL injection is a technique that is used to exploit a SQL injection vulnerability in a web application where the web application does not directly reveal the results of the injected SQL query. So it is not in band, it is blind because you don't know whether the SQL query that you injected was executed successfully and you have to refer to the functionality or, the, or how the web application responds in order to infer whether it was executed successfully or not. So in this type of attack, the attacker utilizes Boolean-based conditional statements to infer the information indirectly. And one example that we used even in in-band SQL injection was the use of OR or the AND logical operators. Now, that was not really blind SQL injection because in those cases, the errors were being returned directly back to us. So it doesn't fall under blind SQL injection. The, the great thing about SQL injection is that logical operators can be used in different contexts. However, they really come into play when you're talking about bl blind based SQL injection. And I'll show you why and why they're so powerful. So uh, blind SQL injection attacks typically occur when the web application does not display database errors or query the results of the web page. So again, going back to the example in error-based SQL injection, if when we were testing, we usually used to, uh, you know, just inject a single quote and that would cause an error. And the web application would tell us that there's an error, therefore confirming the vulnerability. And then we could take it from there. 
with blind uh, with blind SQL injection, you're not going to see errors. You're just going to, if you look close enough, you're just going to see changes in the way the web application responds to true or false uh, SQL queries or SQL queries that utilize Boolean operators, right? So instead, the attacker can manipulate the application's behavior by injecting Boolean conditions into the SQL queries and observing the resulting behavior or response from the web application. And again, I'm going to refer to this diagram that I'd highlighted earlier. And again, you can disregard these example or sample queries here, but they in essence highlight what's going on when we, when we talk about blind uh, SQL injection, specifically Boolean based SQL injection. So we have yourself, which is the attacker, the pen tester or bug bounty hunter, and you're connected to the web application. And again, uh, what you do is you find an application input, uh, you ensure that there isn't any input validation or user input um, sanitization or validation. Uh, once you do that, you then begin testing. So what you do, again, based on whether it's integer or string-based SQL injection, you put in a payload that involves Boolean conditions or logical operators like OR and NOT. And based on that, an example that we can say is, uh, you know, for example, single quote one, or one equals one, and then, or we could change that around and say single quote, uh, or, or, and select where, um, select from, so select uh, all uh, columns from a particular table where the ID equals to the ID of the administrator. And, you know, based on that, whether it's true, the web application will respond in a certain way. If it's false and it's not injected, the web application will respond in a certain way. So what you're trying to do initially is try and find out how the web application responds when, when a, the result of a query is true and how it responds when the result of a query is false. And there's many ways you can do that and that's where we're gonna go through this procedurally. So you should be getting an idea as to what we'll be doing. So the best way again to sort of contextualize this is to go through an example, right? So here's an example uh, that will illustrate the concept. So let's say there's a vulnerable login page that utilizes the following SQL query to check the credentials provided by the user. So we have a login form, we have a username field and a password field, and this is the query that's used by the web application uh, and you know, consequently sent to the database to check for the username and password uh, values that you specify. So select all columns from the table called users, and I want you to look for a username that is the following, and this is what your username parameter would be. The value would be in, uh, injected in there, and again, and again, pay close attention to the data uh, to the data type. Is it string based or integer based? And the password equals to the actual value of the password. So an attacker, and we've done this before, an attacker can attempt a Boolean-based SQL injection attack by manipulating the username parameter. For instance, if the attacker enters the following username, where they again, in, insert a single quote that terminates the string literal, and then we say or one equals one. One equals one is a logical, uh, is a logical operation, or and or not are what you'd call um, logical operators. And then this is a Boolean uh, operation or condition where you essentially utilize typically, uh, you know, mathematical operations, but not limited to where you say one equals one. And we know in mathematics that one, truly is equal uh, to one. If executed successfully, the database will respond with true, all right? And the web application behaves in a certain way if the response to this query is true. It also responds in a certain way if the response to this query is false for whatever reason. And in the case of a login form, if the response from the database is false uh, with regards to this query, the web application will tell you, hey, uh, either your username or your password is incorrect. Now, if it's true, it will log you in. And in this case, what we're doing is we're utilizing this payload, this Boolean base SQL injection payload to bypass the authentication by just returning a true to the, uh, to the actual web application. And the web application says, hey, I've got a true, let me log you in. Not as a specific user, typically as the user that, ha that has the first record within the, uh, the user's table or whatever table it's called. So the resulting query uh, executed by the web application would then become 
select all from users where the username is equal to, and then we add the single quote there and we say or one equals one. And we would typically add a comment here. So if it's a SQLite database, we would add two dashes or a double hyphen, or if it's a MySQL database, we would add the hash symbol or the pound symbol to essentially negate the other, uh, the other part of this query. And again, this is also a logical operator here because it's and, right? So in addition to, to this uh, query here, if we run it this way, then it would also run this one. So we always want to make sure we use a comment so that the, the second part of that query is disregarded. So in this case, the injected portion of single quote or one equals one always evaluates to true, effectively bypassing the original password check. The attacker can then potentially gain unauthorized access or perform other malicious actions. To extract information from the database, an attacker can utilize a technique called blind Boolean-based SQL injection. So now I'm ref specifically referring to a truly blind SQL injection, where you're now really utilizing uh, your Boolean operations or logical operators. So when you talk about blind SQL injection attacks, the attacker doesn't directly see the query results, but utilizes conditional statements to infer the information directly. An example of this is the attacker might craft an injection like single quote or, and then you utilize uh, SQL specific or DBMS specific commands like calculate the length of the database name uh, and uh, check whether the name is greater than five characters. So this will test whether the length of the database name is greater than five characters, right? And the, the reason you're doing this is firstly, to learn more about the actual uh, database that you've uh, that you're performing injection into so you can do this manually many times to identify the length and then from that point you can use another payload to try and guess the name so you'd say uh, is the name of the or is the first character of the database name does it start with a if it responds with a false if the web application responds uh, falsely based on how it uh, responds falsely. If it responds falsely, you know that it doesn't start with an A and then you would go to B, so on and so forth. So that's what I was referring to when I said it's a very manual procedure. And I would typically go about identifying a blind base SQL injection vulnerability first. Once you've confirmed it, then utilize a tool like SQL map to automate the actual exploitation process. So but the, the bottom line is by observing the, app, the web application's response, such as a page displaying specific content or a delay in response, the attacker can gradually extract information about the database structure. All right. Now, when it comes down to the identification and exploitation methodology, it's again quite similar to the other subtypes we've explored previously. Number one, identify potential injection points. So analyze the application's functionality and identify input points where user supplied data is used in SQL queries. Look for parameters in URLs, form fields, cookies, or any other user controllable input. Number two, analyze the web application's behavior. Submit various inputs and observe the application's response. Look for indications of blind vulnerabilities, such as different response times, error messages, not really error messages, but changes really in the application's behavior without directly displaying query results. Number three, craft test payloads. So create payloads that inject Boolean conditions into the, into the input fields that were identified in step one here. And you can use techniques like appending single quote or, and then the condition, and then always end it with a comment to, to, uh, to the input to check if the condition affects the query's logic. All right. Uh, and then of course, moving on, if we move on from this slide to the fourth point here, observe the application's response. This is very important. So submit the crafted payloads and analyze the application's response. Look for differences in behavior that may indicate whether the injected condition is evaluated as true or false. Uh, you can also perform a binary search. This is really the exploitation side of this, uh, of this vulnerability or methodology, where if you detect a difference in behavior but cannot directly extract data, perform a binary search-like approach where you inject conditions that split the possible range in half, testing each half at a time to narrow down the potential values or lengths of data in a database. This is typically really uh, done well or automated with SQL map. And then finally, extract information gradually. So once you've identified a blind Boolean-based SQL injection vulnerability, continue crafting payloads to extract information from the database 
where you can guess the length of strings, characters, or check for the existence of specific data using Boolean operations or Boolean conditions. So uh, we'll be taking a look at that second part with regards to, again, testing a uh, web application's response in the next video. But for now, we're going to take a look at the most common Boolean-based uh, SQL injection attack that allows us to bypass authentication again by uh, analyzing the web application's response. However, in this case, it's very easy to identify whether the, uh, the query that we'll be injecting was successfully executed by the database. And we already took a look at this in the uh, Finding uh, SQL Injection Vulnerabilities Manually video, but we'll revisit it now in a real world web application. So this video has a lab environment attached to it. You can choose to go through uh, the uh, through the practical side of this video first and then go through the lab or vice versa, whatever works for you. Uh, what I'll go ahead and do is start up the lab. Uh, this lab will not provide you with a Kali Linux system. However, we will not require it. You can just open it up in your normal browser and I'll go through some testing phases. So I'm just going to see you back in my own Kali Linux VM because I like doing testing from there. And uh, we can uh, take a look at this uh, very common use of Boolean based SQL injection payloads. So I'll see you there. All right, so I'm back in my Kali Linux VM and I've just copied the link to the lab, which is a public URL. So you'll be provided with the same. As I said, you don't need the use of any specialized tools. I'm just going to be utilizing Burp Suite just so that I can highlight a few things. This is going to be a relatively short demo, but I'll just start a temporary project here and I'll open up the Burp Suite uh, browser that is already configured to proxy traffic to Burp Suite. So go into proxy and just open the browser here. And I'll give this a couple of seconds and I'll just paste in the link that I copied, which will uh, then take us to a web application here called Support Center, all right? Now this is a real world web application and uh, you can see that um, right over here, we have a login form, right? Which is obviously going to be uh, our first attack vector with regards to injection. And you'll start to see a difference here because uh, based on all the exercises that we've done and all the labs we've gone through, the first thing you'll try to do is just put in a single quote there. And now you can see that the web application does not log us in, but just displays a blank page. Now, what does this mean? Hmm, this uh, could mean a few things, but this is exactly what blind SQL injection is. The web application will not give you any indication as to whether the query was executed successfully or in this case not, which means error-based identification methods are not really going to work. Now, in the case of this web application, uh, to save time, uh, what we need to do, and this is not the, this particular login form is not vulnerable to any SQL injection vulnerability. And of course, you 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 are free to test that out. What we can do is again try and uh, perform some basic enumeration to find additional directories that we can test. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I think the best way of doing that would be through uh, something like OASP Zap, which I actually should have launched up to begin with because uh, it'll allow us to perform a quick. Um, a quick directory brute force uh, and also you know it'll help us identify some uh, some hidden login forms that uh, are not publicly visible with regards to this web application so we're just going to start up zap here really quickly and no i do not want to persist my session and we'll open up the oasp zap browser similar to burp suites uh, chromium browser that's already configured to proxy traffic to zap in this particular case so i'll open this up give it a couple of seconds and we can get started with the um, the directory brute force to identify hidden uh, directories and files. So I'll just paste that in there. So paste and go. There we are. And now that is added here as a site. And uh, what we can do uh, is we can uh, just click on this here and I'm going to include it in my default context or my scope, if you will, and hit OK. And now I can go ahead and attack and perform a forced browse directory right over here and the list i want to use is just directory list 1.0 and just start that up and uh, we're doing this to find additional uh, application inputs that are not publicly available because as i just said uh, the login form is not vulnerable to sql injection and i'm doing this to save time so i'm going to let this run for a little bit and i'll get back to you when it's done and we can then take it from there all right, so the directory brute force has gone on for a few seconds to maybe probably a minute. And I'm just going to terminate it here because I've found what I'm looking for. And that is the folder called admin. 
and uh, we can just visit it here and you'll see what that will look like. So I'll just uh, maximize this here and I'll just navigate to a folder called admin that we couldn't uh, previously we couldn't see. And this is the admin panel reserved for administrators. And you can see here that it's a login staff and login administrator. So either one of these forms could be vulnerable to, you know, blind SQL injection, uh, more specifically Boolean based SQL injection. So as you already know, in this particular lab, we're taking a look at the easiest, which we've explored previously. And that is, of course, identification and exploitation or rather bypassing of uh, a login uh, form or authentication, right? So the way we could do this is we first, we are not really sure as to whether it's string based or integer based. However, based on the uh, data types that are likely to be input in here, we can only assume that this will take in a, a string. So we can utilize the single quote there to terminate the string literal and say zero, uh, sorry, single quote or one equals one. And then we could try out the double dash there to see if it is a, um, to see if it's a SQLite database and just hit login and we get an error, but no real data from the database. Okay. So very, very interesting. And this is part of it, but we can say, uh, or a one equals one and we use a single, uh, hash or pound symbol there to see if it's a MySQL database. We hit login and there we are. So we've successfully bypassed the um the authentication form here and remember this is the staff authentication form that's why we're currently the user test so we've essentially bypassed that login here so this is an example of what a typical uh, blind boolean based sql injection attacks uh, looks like now why do i say that uh, the reason i say that is because uh, while this is uh, again a very uh, you know, common example or demonstration that is used to highlight this, this really doesn't expand on what Boolean based injection is all about. And that's why we have the next video where I'll be showing you what it's really about. However, what we can do is also run a false operation or an operation that will, uh, will equal to false or will be always will be will always be false, for example, or one equals two, right? And if we hit login now, you can see that we get an error. The point I'm trying to make here is that the applications will respond differently to different input. And in the case of utilizing, um, in the case of utilizing Boolean based injection or Boolean uh, operators or Boolean conditions, we're able to get the web application to respond in different ways. Now, as I said, this is going to depend heavily on how the web application is designed or developed. So you can see in this case, it says that we can't log in. Now, this uh, is obviously not sending back any data from the database or not invoking an error from the database. So this is not really error based SQL injection. The reason for that is because it gives us an error that we can make sense of. It tells us, hey, we can't log in. Now, a user may be saying to themselves, well, okay, I'm not sure whether this works, but let's see if we say Alexis and password. So I'm entering invalid data and you can see it returns the same response. The point I'm trying to make in, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that we were able to confirm SQL injection, blind SQL injection here because we ran a false operation. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, how is that the case? Well, firstly, we identified how the application responds when incorrect data is submitted. So again, Alexis and password, we see that it responds with error cannot log in. Now, if we say, uh, or, uh, or let's say test, because the username test exists. If I say test and, you know, password three to one, I hit log in here, error cannot log in. So for for all false responses from the database, it'll say error cannot log in. We can confirm that injection is true by injecting a query that will always be false to see whether it responds in the same way. So we say one equals, uh, so single quote or one equals two. And we remember we're not even providing a password, so it should not even respond with uh, a legitimate error uh, based on, you know, the functionality of the web application. So in this case, we know this is always going to be false. So it, so it should tell us that error, you cannot log in. And indeed, it tells us that, which confirms that, yes, uh, in this case, it looks like injection is possible. We just need to find a way of now utilizing Boolean-based SQL injection payloads 
uh, to essentially, you know, extract data or do whatever we want to do. In this case, we are bypassing a login. And again, this can also be done where you can say uh, A equals A. And uh, let's see if this works here. We get an error here. Now that could be because we are passing in. Uh, so I'll say or um, and I'll encapsulate them in uh, single quotes here because they are characters or strings and I'll hit login. There we are. So you can see that uh, the logical or Boolean conditions allow us to, uh, you know, to test the web application. In the case of blind SQL injection, we're not looking for SQL errors. We're looking for how the web application responds based on what we inject. So again, in this case, it looks very traditional. You may even misconstrue this for error-based injection. However, in the next video, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about when I say that you truly are blind when dealing with blind SQL injection vulnerabilities. With that being said, um, this is uh, going to conclude the practical demonstration side or section of this video. All right, so in this video, we've gotten an introduction or a reintroduction as to what blind SQL injection vulnerabilities are. And we've also got an introduction as to what Boolean uh, Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities are all about. And we took a look at a practical example, a very popular example of what a Boolean based, uh, blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities look like with regards to identifying them and then exploiting them. We're now going to turn our attention to a much more uh, traditional use or demonstration of blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. And again, consequently, how to identify and exploit them this time in a real world web application. And of course, we just took a look at a real world web application, but this is going to be more so uh, traditional, uh, you know, typically web applications you're likely to see out there. With that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. exploiting Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. Now that we have a basic understanding or a fundamental understanding as to how Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities work, we're going to take a practical look at how to identify and exploit blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities in the wild. So this will be more focused on my methodology and what I typically do and the tools that I run when, um, you know, identifying and exploiting blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. So this video has a lab environment attached to it. You can choose to watch the video and then go through the lab or vice versa, uh, depending on whether or not you want a challenge. Uh, this lab environment will not provide you uh, with a Kali Linux system. So you'll need to utilize your own. Uh, you will require uh, the use of a web proxy if you want to perform effective testing. And this will also apply to the uh, next video where we'll be taking a look at time-based SQL injection vulnerabilities and uh, attacks. So I'm going to fire up the lab environment. You'll be provided with a link to the target web application. It is a real world web application and you'll uh, get a tacit feel and understanding as to uh, you know, what or how blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities look look like and how they can be exploited or tested. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to switch over into my own Kali Linux virtual machine. I'll fire up the lab and let's get started. All right, so I am back in my Kali Linux VM and I'm going to be utilizing Burp Suite as my web proxy of choice. Uh, you can utilize OASP Zap if uh, you're more comfortable with that. Uh, we're pretty much just going to be utilizing the repeater. So I'm going to open up Burp Suite because I'm going to be utilizing the inbuilt Burp Suite browser because it's already configured to proxy all traffic to Burp Suite and we will require it to analyze requests. So I'm going to start a temporary project here and we're going to give this a couple of seconds. There we are. We'll head over into the proxy. I'm just going to disable intercept temporarily and we're going to open up the browser here and that's going to open up Chromium and I'm just going to paste in the link provided to me by the lab. Uh, as I said, in this case, you will require a web proxy. So again, you can run this on Windows as long as you have Burp Suite or OASP Zap, uh, it'll work. So as you can see, this is the target web application that is vulnerable to 
uh, boolean based blind sql injection as you can see it is a content management system a very simple one nonetheless but uh, uh, one that will highlight what a blind sql injection vulnerability uh, looks like uh, in the wild uh, more specifically one that is vulnerable to uh, or one that can be exploited via boolean based uh, sql injection payloads and will not be targeting something as simple as the login form what we want to pay attention to in this particular case are the blog posts so if we take a look at the actual content management system or the blog itself you can see that we have multiple posts here and uh looks like there are quite a few if we take a step back you can see we have um, quite a few old ones it just looks like that these uh one two three and four blog posts two of which are missing images so if we click on the first one here i want you to pay attention to the url you can see that in this case uh, we have the url of the website and then a page called post.php referring to blog posts and then uh, blog posts are selected or identified via the parameter post is equal to and then the value of the actual post or the id of the post which means this is uh, somewhat a somewhat of a dynamic parameter in that uh, you know a post with an id of one is this post here and you can see under every post we have the ability to leave a comment and some people have uh, left a few comments here like hello each day of my life is a story and uh, so etc so you can see that that uh, is fairly simple to understand now as per everything that we've learned in this course so far we can see that we're this is the first time we're really dealing with an integer based uh, parameter and as a result this is most likely going to involve integer based payloads which means that uh, we do not uh, you know test for or we cannot utilize the um, single quote to terminate the string literal because this is a an integer as you can see here now what that means is that if we try and go to a post with an id of two and we hit enter it's going to take us to the next blog post here with that particular id all right and the same goes if i go over to post three uh, you can see that it takes us to the post with that ID and uh, we can continue doing this sequentially until we reach the end of the posts. In this case, it only looked like there were four posts. So if I try the fifth post, let's take a look at how the web application behaves. So if I enter a value that is invalid here, it takes us direct to a page which looks quite interesting. Uh, in this case, it looks like it's a blank page and the only other fields or elements left over are the leave comment uh, is the leave comment model here that allows you to leave comments uh, and then whatever was juxtaposed or aligned on the right of the page is moved to the bottom so it's essentially a blank page all right so if we go back i'll be able to verify that for you so if we go to post four you can see that whatever was on the right was pushed to the bottom and that's because there isn't a blog post with an id of five because there are only four blog posts so that's very interesting the reason i'm doing this as i said is i'm trying to monitor the application's response uh to invalid data or uh you know in this particular case the id of a of the post parameter that doesn't exist uh, most likely doesn't exist in the database now in this case we know that this application input is directly interacting with the database in some way or form we're not too sure about the query which actually makes sense because this is blind sql injection so the first thing we can do as i say is identify the application input the injectable parameter but now we need to test it and see you know whether we have any form of sql injection now remember this is blind boolean based sql injection and we're dealing with an a uh, an integer here with regards to the value of the parameter so that means we don't need to utilize the single quote to terminate the string literal we can immediately go ahead and you know put in a logical operation here or a boolean condition where you can say zero uh, one or the actual value or we say uh, or one equals one and then we test out what comment works here based on the backend DB, uh, DBMS being used. So is it SQLite? Is it PostgreSQL? Is it MySQL? We've already gone through this process. So I'll hit enter and let's see what the output is. All right. So this is what I was talking about. I want you to pay close attention to what happens when we 
uh, essentially inject a Boolean based SQL injection payload. So in this case, what we've done is we've said post equals one and the value of, uh, or rather there is a post with an ID of one, which means that that evaluates to true. And then we're saying, or one equals one. All right. So what this means in this particular case, it this is pretty inconsequential, uh, apart from the fact that all of the other blog posts are being listed here, this particular statement does not really confirm uh, SQL injection. The reason I'm saying that is because we have uh, this particular post ID exists. So if we were to change this to maybe post ID of five and then say, or one equals one, that would uh, realistically confirm it, but we still don't know how the web application is going to respond to this. So I'll hit enter. And you can see in this particular case, it just returns the same result. All right, which is to be expected here. So, you know, uh, we know that there isn't a post with an ID of five, so it will run the logical operation here. So or one equals one. And in this case, based on the query, it should display all of the other blog posts, which indeed it does. All right, now this, as I said, is not yet um, a confirmation of SQL injection, and I'll explain why. All right, we can confirm this by tweaking our logical operation here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back to post one here, and I'll go into my web proxy, which is Burp Suite, and turn on intercept, and I will just reload this page. All right, so this is what the uh, the request looks like. It is a GET request, all right, and we can see that the uh, parameter, the injectable parameter is in the URL and nothing else is in the body. So we can send this to the repeater where we can modify the request and view the responses based on specific uh, parameters or, you know, tests we want to perform. So I'm just going to resize this so it matches uh, a little bit better or it displays the actual HTTP request a, a little bit better. All right. So as I said, we were utilizing the OR option. Now, what we want to do is not change the value of five, right? And I'll explain why. So if I change this to a five, you can see that it will uh, essentially, uh, in this particular case, let's render the output here. You can see that it, you know, gives us that blank page. And, uh, you know, we have the comment modal here, as well as uh, everything that was aligned to the right. So, you know, the search bar, the login form, the categories, etc. So let's try and run that operation one more time here. So one equals one. And we need to URL encode this because it is being sent in the URL. So control U and we'll send this here. We take a look at the output. It looks like it is vulnerable to SQL injection based on how the web application responds. Of course, it doesn't respond with an error or data from the database because in this case, it, the, it most likely the query is uh, the query being used by the web application uh, is pretty much going to is pretty much interacting with a particular with a particular table and is pulling data um, you know pertinent to blog posts, right? And in this particular case, the best way we can test all of this out is to play around with the lo the logical operation here. So I'm just going to undo the URL and code here. And what if we say one equals two? All right. So this is now an operation that is going to be false in both cases, right? And we pretty much know what to expect. It should take us to that particular page that uh, does not have any content in the body and just has the uh, the actual uh, components that make up the web page. So the, you know, the comment form, uh, as well as the, um, you know, the login, the login form, etc. So I'll log in here, or I'll send that request here. And you can see we pretty much get the same. So the, the key thing that I want you to note is that when there is uh, an incorrect SQL query or a query that uh, points uh, that will provide a false response, the web application responds by taking us to a, a blank page with the rest of the components of the web page. All right. That that's uh, what looks like uh, that essentially is what's going on here with regards to how the web application is responding. Now we can confirm this, as I said, really well by saying something like one and then using the and operator one and one is equal to one. And the reason we're doing this is we know that the post with an idea of one exists. So we're saying, OK, that exists. Uh, and I also want you to run this operation. Now, 
in this particular case, if either one of these operations fails with regards to returning a false value from the database or a false response from the database, we should be taken to this particular screen here based on the analysis we have performed. So we're essentially saying, we're telling the web application, okay, uh, post ID with one, okay, we know that that exists. However, in order for this entire uh, SQL query to be successful, both of these need to check out as true. And we know one equals one is always going to be true. So in this particular case, let's see what the output is or how the web application responds. So I'll uh, URL encode this here and I'll send that over. And now in the response, you can see that now this is a proper confirmation of the SQL injection. The reason I'm saying that is because both of these operations need to be true. And now it doesn't display all of the other blog posts because everything is true. All right, now what if, again, we change this to, instead of one equals one, we change this to one equals two, which is going to be false and will therefore invalidate uh, the entire query here, irregardless of whether one is true or one is a legitimate uh, ID of a real blog post. So the point being is, and is very useful in this uh, these types of confirmation checks. The or is not really that useful because either one of the checks or operations uh, needs to be correct in order for the entire query to be correct. So I'll give you an example here. So we'll say one and one equals two. So one will be true, which is the post ID of one, which does exist. However, this one here will be false because one is not equal to two. So I will highlight this and control U to URL encode it. And let's see what the application's response is. So there we are. It uh, takes us to this blank page with uh, the rest of the components of the web page. So based on what we've done thus far, we can, we pretty much have an understanding of how the web application responds primarily if the SQL query uh, or the web application uh, returns a false, um, returns the results as false or the uh, results from the database are false. Now, in this case, we've confirmed blind SQL injection because uh, we were able to, you know, utilize the or one equals one option or logical operation there, uh, you know, firstly to display all of the other blog posts on the same page. But now, we're essentially verifying the uh, Boolean the Boolean operation or Boolean condition to test the logic and see whether it is accurate with regards to how the web application responds. So just to summarize or to, uh, to go over it again, when you utilize and, if you've ever done mathematics, um, and I think I can show you this here, we have or, and, and not. All right, so in the case of or, we're essentially saying one of two in this particular case needs to be true. All right, so it will essentially evaluate the entire statement as true. So entire statement uh, as true. And of course, never do this in the actual request or the body of the request. But and then in and, we're essentially saying two out of two or as many need to be true in order for this to be, um, in order for this to be true. All right. If one out of two is true, the statement statement will return uh, will essentially statement will equate to false because only one of the two operations has been met or conditions has been met. And in the case of not, uh, that one is not really applicable in this particular case, but you get the idea. These are logical operations here. So we've actually confirmed this quite a lot based on, you know, the actual responses from the web application. And this is exactly what I was talking about. You're not going to get an error or confirmation of successful SQL injection or any data from the database. The web application will just respond in different ways. And of course, we can test this out as well when we say, for example, A is equal to B, which is going to equate to false we can just URL encode this and it should take us to this exact blank page here uh, that doesn't respond or give us any data. So I'll send that over and there we are, fantastic. However, now if we utilize the OR option again and reverse the, uh, the values of the parameter in a way that uh, I can prove what I'm saying. So let's say we enter a uh, you know, post ID of 10, right? Which we know doesn't exist based on initial testing and we say, you know, and 
or in this particular case, or one equals one, we know that one equals one is going to be true, but this is not true here. So let's try and take a guess and let's see what will happen based on what we've just discussed. Based on what we've just discussed, this should display all blog posts. All right, so we'll just hit send. And there we are. So you can see based on the test, it's not displaying the other blog posts, but they're linked here. So again, based on our testing, we can see that uh, at this point, we actually don't even need this particular ID parameter to run our checks. So what we could say is just or one equals one and let's test out, let's test this out and let's see what happens. So I'll send this over. And in this case, there's an error, right? And uh, the reason for that might be because we don't have a delimiter there. Let's add that here. Let's see what happens. There we are still an error. So this is because of the or option, which is asking for, uh, is asking the database to run another operation. If we say and, for example, in this particular case, I'll just uh, get rid of this here. And if we say, you know, and uh, one equals one, and let's URL encode this here. Let's see what the response is. And again, I'm just running tests just to get a better understanding of what's going on. So in this case, it looks like it requires that parameter. Uh, what we can try and do instead of doing that is let's use the delimiter here and uh, let's send that over just to see whether it will process that second option here. So in this case, it looks like it needs uh, a first value and then something after that. So, you know, we could put in even an ID of 100, which again doesn't exist. So if we send this over, you should see that it, um, you know, it takes us to the blank page. However, we can say or uh, evaluate this option one equals one and if either one of them is true uh, then you know this is going to be true and in this case it will display uh, you know in this particular case what appears to be all of the blog posts within the um, blog posts uh, table so I can uh, just uh, control you to URL encode this and hit send and it should display all blog posts so there we are fantastic all right, so we've been able to test out and confirm blind SQL injection by analyzing the behavior of the web application. And as I said, you're not limited to, you know, just running these very simple um, operations. What I wanted to show you specifically is how we can uh, identify uh, using Boolean based injection other information regarding the database. So let's say we wanted to confirm and again, remember how the web application responds when an operation, a Boolean operation is true and how it responds when it's false. All right. So the point being is if I just undo this here and I say one equals two, it should take us to that blank page, right? So I'll URL encode this here. It'll take us to this blank page. So whenever it's false, it takes us here. Okay. Now, what if I wanted to run a quick check here where we can leave 100 there and we can say or, and after this, we can uh, utilize, in this particular case, we would need an and option. So we need to use um, the idea of a blog post that actually exists. So we'll use one and we'll say and. If we wanted to check the um, perform manual testing to identify the version at a high level of MySQL or the uh, the database that's running, in this case, we know it's MySQL, of course, uh, that enumeration can be performed, but we can essentially uh, perform an additional operation where we check what with the first uh, character of the version of MySQL and we can perform checks to see or identify which version it is, right? So just the first uh, version number. So, you know, version numbers in the case of in the case of MySQL and other software releases are, you know, 1.1.1, right? In this particular case, we know that MySQL version 3 is still operational. So we might have 3.1, there could be a 4.0, there could be a 5.0. So based on these true or false responses, which we have now learned how, uh, how to identify, we can pretty much run the following query or inject the following SQL query. So in brackets, we'll say version, and uh, we want to check for the first, the first character, right? And uh, we are going to say that's equals to, and we can say, for example, in this particular case, we know that one uh, is true. So there is a post with an ID of one. 
And in this particular case, remember, we are saying, uh, can you please, in addition to, you know, checking for this particular blog post, can you also run this operation? And in this particular case, because of the AND operator, both of them need to be true. So the point being, if the database or the backend DBMS is not MySQL version 4, it will return as false, all right? And it'll take us to this particular page here. So if it's true, it will take us or display all blog posts. So it'll actually take us to the blog post one, sorry, not all blog posts. So we can control you to URL and code this and let's see what the response is. So the response here is, yeah, it takes us to the blank page and nothing else. If we go to, uh, if we change the four here to maybe a three, it will pretty much give us the same thing here. However, if we change the version to five, and I know that the backend DBMS is MySQL version five, and I hit send, you can see it takes us to the blog post one, and that confirms that MySQL version five is running as the backend relational uh, database management system, which is absolutely fantastic. So this should give you an idea as to how, um, you know, the actual methodology behind identifying and exploiting Boolean based uh, blind or rather blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. As you can see, it's a very manual process. And this is an example of a payload that I typically run when roughly speaking, I'm, I know that I'm dealing with a MySQL database, of course, uh, there's other ways, you know, you can go about extracting this information. Now, from this point on, it is, it is extremely wise to test this vulnerability or to test the efficacy of your findings or the actual uh, SQL injection vulnerability with a tool like SQL map. And the only thing you're doing here is just verifying whether what you've identified is true which is always something important to do, especially in the case of blind SQL injection. So I'm going to save the initial request here on my desktop as just request. Okay, and I'll hit save. And I'm not now going to open up a terminal. And I'll navigate to the desktop and I'll say CD desktop. And we can say SQL map the request is the request file or the file containing the request in this case is just called request. And the parameter we want to inject uh, is post if I can confirm that. Yes, that is correct. And uh, we just hit enter and SQL map will do the rest for us. So there we are. It's going to begin the testing and let's see if it confirms whether we have Boolean based blind injection. In this particular case, it confirms it, it says the get parameter post appears to be and Boolean based. So pay attention to the logical operator here which is very important, which is why I showed you it's important to only utilize and because you're confirming the entire statement, including the actual parameter, the value of the parameter. So and Boolean based blind where or having clause injectable. So it is uh, injectable here. It's now going to say it looks like the back end DBMS is MySQL. Do you want to skip the uh, skip test payload specific for the database management systems? Yes, we do. So I'm just going to use the default option. And uh, do you want to include all tests for MySQL extending the provided level one and risk uh, one values? Yes, default option there. And it's going to perform various tests now. In this particular case, we're going to let this run here. So error based, uh, it's going to go through some error based testing. And uh, then it's going to go through some um, blind time based SQL injection testing as well. So just going through all the error based payloads that, uh, you know, for the various versions of MySQL. And uh, there we are. So I'm going to let this complete. And uh, once it's done, I want to, uh, we're going to take a look at the results and I'm going to show you how cool uh, blind Boolean based SQL injection is. All right, SQL map has done its magic and it looks like there's multiple types or subtypes of SQL injection vulnerabilities that affect that particular parameter. In this particular case, you can see we have Boolean based blind and the payload used was post equals one and 
uh, you know, just a logical operation like 5762 equals 5762, which is the equivalent of what we did with 1 equals 1. Again, you can use any value you want here as long as it uh, equates to true or all is always true, then you should be good here. And you're not limited just to integers, but also characters as long as you concatenate them with the, the single quotes. Uh, and uh, we also have time-based blind, which is very interesting on the same parameter. Uh, we'll be exploring blind, uh, blind-based blind SQL injection in the next video. And we also have union-based SQL injection here, which you can also test out. Uh, but this is going to be blind. And what we're looking for is something um, is something that, uh, you know, will clearly verify what, you know, whatever is in the database or will clear, clearly verify injection uh, as it were. Now you can see that we we're also able to verify that the info we uh, we were able to infer through our manual testing was correct. The version or the first character um, in the MySQL version is five, which we were able to test. Now to show you something here that is really cool, we can also say uh, we can see that the versioning here has one, two, three, four, five, and six uh, characters uh, in total, right? So six uh, decimal places, if you will, uh, because we're now dealing with a number. So we can actually check the sixth place here using that same payload to see whether it's two. And this will prove that the blind SQL injection vulnerability is indeed working. So I'll go into the repeater and now we'll change this to the sixth here and we'll say uh, in this particular case um, the payload that we utilized here is uh, going to be equal to six so we'll just change the five to a six and if it's true it should uh, again display blog post with the id of one so i'll hit send uh, that's if i've got the placement correct there we are fantastic that proves that we are correct so again we can test it with any other like a one two three four four and five, which is one. So let's try uh, the fifth place, which is going to be one. So I'll change this here from six to six to five to five. And we can say, is that equal to six? This will be false. And then I'll change it to one to show that it's true. So six, there we are, false. The web application, we have already identified that it responds in certain ways. In this case, we know that if it's false, it'll take us to this blank page. And we change this to a one which you have been able to verify with SQL map. Uh, in this particular case, it says that is also false. Very interesting. Uh, let's check that again. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that should be one, uh, the fifth character there. In this particular case, it may be referring to the fact that uh, the fifth is one. Uh, yes, that should be correct. So one, two, three, four, five, that is one. Let's send that again. Um, if we say, uh, let's change that to five and, uh, sorry, five and five, six, change that here, or actually six and five, that should verify it. We just change it to six. I just want to see something here, whether it's treating it as a single integer. So we'll send that as 12, if it counts the yeah, so it only looks like in this case, if we just say two, then that should be true. Uh, hold on, so that's false. So one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm not sure. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Yeah, that should be two. I'm not sure what's up with that particular query. Uh, let us just um, write it again. So that's six, six, and then uh, that's equal to two. Uh, that should equate to true, but we can write it again anyway. So we can say and uh, substring um, version, and we're going to say the sixth, sixth character, sixth character, uh, and that's going to be um, equal to six. All right, let's test this out. All right, that looks like it's working. So I'll send that again. It looks like when we sent there, we are all right. So it just looks like there's an issue with the encoding when we changed it. So if we change this to five and five, and we change this to, um, sorry, not six, uh, what we want is the uh, two there. So let's change this to two, uh, actually one. I'm not sure whether it's treating them as one 
uh, we can actually try that. So one, two, three, four. So we say four is two. Um, four is two. Again, you also have to factor in how it's treated by the query here. Um, we could also just say MySQL version. Let's just confirm whether the first one is correct. So I'll say one, one and change this to five. First character. Okay, so that is valid. So it um, looks like we would need to convert this into ASCII. Oh, sorry, not into ASCII, into hex for it to process it. But uh, you get the idea. The version is correct. We were able to do that through blind SQL injection or blind Boolean based SQL injection. Now, with, um, as I said, uh, you can perform the exploitation of the vulnerability and exfiltration of data. Uh, via SQL map, uh, primarily because it uh, does it uh, out of band, but I can also show you that we we are able to confirm a little bit more. So uh, if I go ahead and in this particular case, I can say DBS to list the databases with SQL map to see what we have here. Um, you can see it's going to fetch the database names. All right. So we have three database names, which again, just proves that the, the site is vulnerable to SQL injection or that post parameter is vulnerable to blind SQL injection. Uh, we can, uh, we know that the, the name of the target web application is Victor CMS. So we can say now the database to uh, target or to list out is Victor. And we can say tables to list out the tables in the database Victor. So fetching tables, there we are. And we have a users table here. So we can now say the table is users and then we can say columns. So we can list out the columns in that particular table called uh, users. And in this particular case, you can see that we have um, the following columns. So user email, user first name, user ID, user image, user last name, etc. Uh, we can also just say dump to display it all. So essentially that particular uh, that particular table. So you can see users contains the following info. We have user ID, random salt. These are all columns, username, user role, user email. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you that the, the blind uh, Boolean based SQL injection testing actually works. So what we can do is we can try and confirm, you know, uh, let's say the, uh, the first, uh, we can try and confirm, you know, the value of a particular character or particular data within any of these columns. So we could say, for example, and I can show you that payload here. Um, let's just get rid of that here. So I can say one, uh, and substring and in double brackets what I'll put in here we can say select and we will select the uh, column user email all right and I'll show you I'll explain what's going on so I can say select um, user email from the table called uh, the table called uh, users, all right? So select the column user email from the table called users. And then we say where, uh, we can say maybe, um, let's say username, username, un uh, sorry, user underscore name, I believe is the correct format for that particular column. Yes, so username um, is equal to, and let's see a value that exists. I just want to show you that this does work. So username admin, so we can use admin as an example. So we can say where username equals, and we'll put this in single quotes here, username equals admin, we'll close this and say, um, let's do something a bit more intense. So we can say the second character is a D, right? So we can say admin, uh, let's use the second character here. So two and two, close that bracket and we'll say, can you please tell us if the second character in this particular that matches the username admin, uh, in this particular case, we're checking the user email. So my apologies. So in this case, uh, the user email is just admin at admin, which we don't know. So we're essentially trying to see whether 
the second character in the email uh, that matches the user admin uh, is greater than let's say A, which we know it is, we can say greater than C. And it should be true because D is greater than C. All right, so let's try that type of operation. So we'll say is greater than, uh, sorry, let me just put a space there because I wanted to treat it correctly. So C, and then we'll add a comment and let us encode this particular payload. So control U, if it's true, it should take us to this, um, to the blog post uh, with the ID one or the first blog post. So let's send. In this case, it looks like it is false. So uh, let me check or recheck my query here. So uh, one and substring. Um, yeah, that looks like it is correct. Um, select user email from the table users where username is equal to admin. And uh, the second character is, should be greater than C, which it is. And um, what we'll do here is, I think what we can do is I'm just trying to find any formatting issues. Let's try and give these a bit of space here. So my bad, let me just unencode that again here and we'll give a little bit of spacing here because there may be a formatting issue there. Um, there we are, and we'll say control U, hit send, if true, which it is true, then that should uh, take us to the blog post with an ID of one, but in this case, it looks like it's still fault, it's still um, false. If I say substring and change it from, you know, substring to just substring of the short form and hit send. Uh, that still looks like it's false. Um, let us uh, unencode this. I just want to see. So one and substring, that is correct. Uh, we may have an issue where I need to utilize or change this to uppercase in certain cases. Substring, and then we say select. Uh, Let's change that to uppercase user email from the table users. Let's change this to uppercase. So from user where the username is equal to um, in this particular case, we will need to specify the, you know, the absolute value, which in this case is admin, which we know exists. And then to, to uh, let's get rid of the spaces that may be causing an issue. And um, yeah, we would need to check the value and we'd say that is greater than C. And um, we could probably change this to uppercase, just want to see what will happen. And we'll say control and code and it's send. Okay, still false. Change this to a lowercase C, just want to see what happens there. That is still false. And um, let's see. Um, um, let's change this to an A. Okay, still false. Um, we may want to actually hold on. Let's unencode this here. Uh, just undo that. And let's try and use a different comment here, given what we're trying to do. So I will just encode this here. So control encode or control U. Send this over. Okay. Um, let's just verify. So select user email from users where the username. Um, we may need to change this. If I just say uh, we may be getting an issue because of that, but we could just say user name, send that over. And we'll change this to a C, send that over. Um, second character. Uh, let's try this here. I want to just make sure that this is indeed working. And um,
greater than C, hit send, still false. And I found my mistake. This is why you should always um, verify table names. I had specified use as the table name, whereas it was users. Let's send this over. So in this particular case, uh, username, uh, let's change this here, you to back to user email. So, and substring select user email from users where username, uh, let me verify the table name, username, user email. Yeah, that is correct. Um, plus username is equal to admin. And we matching that so first position is greater than C, which would be false. So we can change this to less than C, uh, which would be true and would take us there, hopefully. So let's hit send. And there we are. All right, so it took a little bit of testing, which is one of the qualms of uh, blind uh, Boolean based SQL injection. But there we are, we can see. So what I did is because I remembered I changed this to the first character which in this case was an A. So that's why when we are saying greater than C, it would obviously be false. And that's why it was giving us that same blank page, which we know the web application responds to whenever there's a false, uh, whenever there's a false response or whenever the query returns a false response as it were. Uh, we can also play around with this. So we can say uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, right? So fifth we can say is, uh, greater than M. So we'll say the fifth character right over here is uh, greater than M. Let's see. Uh, there we are. And fantastic. If we say if it greater than N, you'll see it will take us to the false page. Uh, actually, that uh, was correct. Fifth place greater than N admin. Uh, that's very weird. Uh, let's try, um, is it greater than O? Yeah, there we are. Okay, so it counted that there, but uh, there you go. You can see that uh, that evaluates to false. So based on this, the reason why I'm showing you this is you can sort of identify or you can utilize blind Boolean based SQL injection to identify, you know, data manually, character by character, just by performing these logical tests. So in this case, the reason why I did it with SQL map is just to verify that what I'm showing you is true. Now, uh, in this particular case, what we can do is again, change this to another username. So for example, you know, we could change it to Victor, and we could do the same thing. So uh, it'll just do that as, as a final test here. So select user email. Uh, from users where the username is equal to Victor. And I'll make sure that it is case sensitive. So Victor, we make sure that his username is actually correct here. Uh, the reason why I want to make sure is because this is formatted in ASCII. So I'm just going to dump it again. Uh, so that is displayed in my terminal correctly. So uh, username Victor, yes, that's uppercase. So Victor's email is, uh, you know, we have second character is I. Uh, so that we can say greater than H, uh, for example, because I comes after H. So in here, we would say first and second. So let's change that here. So Victor, second greater than H. And let's send that over. And there we are, we said uh, greater than uh, J, or greater than K, for example. Uh, and let me just undo that there. So greater than K, that would be false and would take us to the blank page. So you should now have an understanding as to how cool this is because uh, again, I've used a, you know, obviously a query that um, would obviously infer that I know a lot about the databases and the tables and the column names, but I was just using it to show you that once you've identified a blind SQL injection 
vulnerability, blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerability, you can utilize or you can perform this type of manual testing if you don't want to um, utilize something like SQL map, uh, you know, of course, for the exploitation of the vulnerability, but this shows you how you can do it manually with regards to extracting information. So what I was, what I was pretty much saying is, you know, I can say, you know, for the first position, and in this case, I'm checking the email, I can say, is it, um, is the email less than Z, right? So uh, the first character within the email, is it uh, less than Z? Or anything lower than Z? Yes. Okay. So I, I have to sort of narrow it down. So I can say, is it lower than, um, uh, is it uh, lower than W to see whether it's Victor or starts with a V? Okay. So there we are. We can already see it, it, coincidentally Victor is the one who wrote this blog post. So uh, we know that uh, it's lower than V. Uh, is it greater than U? So just showing you how you'd go about doing this. So we know that now it falls between U and W, which means the first uh, character of his email um, is starts with a V. And then we know we you can just keep on going. As I said, it's a very long manual process, but uh, just wanted to show you that uh, you can go ahead and take a look at the other SQL injection vulnerabilities or subtypes as you, uh, if you want to call them that. Uh, and that is going to conclude the practical demonstration side of this video. All right, so now you've gotten uh, a first hand look and uh, practical experience with uh, regards to how to identify and exploit blind Boolean based SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, the lab is uh, really, really cool. And as you can see, it is uh, quite interesting to uh, to see what you can do with various payloads. And as I said, once you've gotten a grasp as to how the application responds to either, uh, you know, true or false, or, you know, responses from the databases that are either true or, font, or, true or false, you'll be able to, uh, you know, easily understand or determine whether your payload was successfully injected or not based on, you know, what we had done. And I wanted to keep it as manual and as raw as possible. So you can see what I typically do, you know, the common issues you run into, like uh, providing incorrect uh, table names, so on and so forth. So uh, hopefully that was valuable to you. Uh, we're now going to turn our attention to um, time-based uh, SQL injection. So that's what we'll be exploring in the next video. Exploiting time-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. In this video, we're going to get an introduction as to what uh, time-based SQL injection vulnerabilities are, how they can be identified, and how they can be exploited. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is this is, of course, a subtype of blind SQL injection, and it really doesn't differ that much uh, from its counterpart, which as you know, is Boolean based SQL injection. Uh, the only difference is what you're monitoring in terms of the functionality of the web application. So with Boolean based um, blind SQL injection, we were pretty much monitoring the actual functionality of the website and what information or the way it responded back after we injected an SQL query. And we were sort of using that uh, to infer whether our SQL query or our payload was injected successfully. With time-based SQL injection vulnerabilities, it's pretty much the same process. However, now instead of monitoring the functionality and the responses of the actual website um, with regards to the payloads or the queries that we're injecting, we're now turning our attention to monitoring the response times of the actual uh, web application that is vulnerable or could potentially be vulnerable. And you may be asking yourself, how do we go about doing this? Or how does time come into play? Well, this is something that we have already explored, I think in the uh, finding SQL injection vulnerabilities manually video, where we took a look at the sleep command, uh, the sleep SQL command that essentially delays or uh, yeah, essentially delays the execution of the query or the response of the um, 
the response of the database with regards to our query. And, uh, you know, we're essentially using that or injecting time-based parameters into our payload uh, to uh, essentially invoke or to get the database to either delay uh, the execution or the response of the results for a certain amount of time. And the reason why we're doing that is so that we can actually tell if the query that we injected was executed successfully. So we're essentially saying, okay, uh, the best way we can prove whether, you know, this site is vulnerable to SQL injection is through uh, or is by leveraging the technique of telling the database to delay the execution or to, to delay the sending of the response or the results, therefore, you know, uh, telling us or inferring that, um, a SQL injection vulnerability exists or doesn't. So the point being is if you inject an SQL query uh, and you tell the database to you know uh, sleep for five seconds and you monitor the response and you see that it obeys that or that the response takes longer or you know matches the time parameter you specified in this case five seconds, then you know that your SQL query or payload was injected successfully. If it doesn't, there could be an issue with the syntax of your payload, but in most uh, in most cases, it means that you know it wasn't injected by the uh, by the actual database. Uh, so, uh, really, really cool vulnerability. I'm a huge fan of time-based uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities. So, uh, this video is really going to provide you with an introduction to um, time-based SQL injection vulnerabilities, and will show you how to identify and exploit them, and of course, how to go about monitoring the response times based on the types of payloads you use. So as usual, uh, let's revisit the SQL injection types and subtypes uh, hierarchy tree to see where we are currently. So we've already covered uh, inbound SQL injection uh, and the consequent subtypes that fall under inbound SQL injection. We've also covered Boolean based SQL injection, which falls under blind SQL injection. And we're now taking a look at the final uh, subtype or technique, which is time-based SQL injection. So that begs the question, what is time-based SQL injection? Time-based SQL injection is a technique that is used to exploit vulnerabilities in a web application's database layer by manipulating the SQL queries to introduce delays. So we're trying to induce delays and you know the fact that a delay occurs after injection proves that the query was executed by the database, consequently proving that it is vulnerable to SQL injection. If it doesn't, then we know that either there's something wrong with our payload or the site isn't vulnerable to SQL injection, in this case, time-based SQL injection. So this type uh, of attack relies on the ability to inject malicious SQL code that causes the application to pause or delay its response revealing information about the database structure or data. The basic idea behind time-based SQL injection is to inject SQL statements that force the application to wait for a certain period of time before responding. The attacker can then infer information about the database by measuring the delay in the application's response. So if you tell the database within your query to sleep for five seconds, and you monitor, uh, you monitor the response and you see that it actually returns the response or the web application response after five seconds, which is actually quite long, then you know, hey, my payload is uh, was executed successfully. And of course, you can increase that duration, which is the great thing. So you can increase it to an absurd uh, number, so 30 seconds. And you know, if you get the response after 30 seconds, then you know for sure that your payload was executed. And um, you know, this is uh, sort of the essence of blind SQL injection. Uh, you're not really focused on the behavior of the web application with regards to uh, how it handles, uh, you know, results from the database, whether they be true or false, uh, you're really focused on, you know, uh, manipulating or getting uh, the database to execute the query based on your own parameters, in this case, utilizing time based parameters, uh, to essentially prove to you that yes, this was executed by the database, uh, or, you know, vice versa, to essentially prove that it wasn't executed by the database. So, uh, the key thing is that the attacker can infer information about the database by measuring the delay in the application's response. And uh, here's an example of a time-based SQL injection attack. And let's assume we have a vulnerable login form where a user provides their username and password and the application performs an SQL query to validate the credentials. This is very common. I always like revisiting the infamous login form. So uh, the query is as follows. Uh, select all columns from the table called users where the username is equal to and then the value of the username parameter is passed in here as a string. 
that is denoted by the single quotes, uh, the double single quotes. And then uh, there's also verification of the password or the value of the password parameter. Right, so an attacker could uh, exploit this vulnerability by injecting malicious SQL code that introduces a delay. For example, the attacker might provide the following input as the username. So you add uh, the single quote here to terminate the string literal. That's because the parameter username parameter is usually treated as a string. And then we utilize a logical operator or a Boolean operation. But in this case, we're essentially saying, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and execute or try and find this user. Uh, or if that fails, you can go ahead and run this command, which is sleep. So it'll tell the database to sleep for five seconds before, you know, the next request or before returning the response and then, you know, receiving the next set of queries. And then, of course, we use the comment, uh, the comment symbol here, um, or we essentially start up a comment to uh, essentially ensure that the consequent query that checks the password is not executed. So, uh, you know, you'd be... Uh, this looks like a typical uh, Boolean based SQL injection attack where we bypass the login. But in this case, uh, of course, if we're dealing with uh, blind SQL injection vulnerabilities uh, and it's not vulnerable to, you know, your typical Boolean based SQL injection attacks um, or payloads, then we can utilize the sleep timer here to essentially uh, verify whether the query is being executed at all or not. And there's m multiple payloads that you can utilize and I'll hopefully I'll be able to show you quite a few of them. So the point is that the injected code, single quote or sleep uh, for five seconds and uh, the comment symbol here modifies the original query to select all columns from the table called users where the username equals to and then single quote terminates the string literal or you can just sleep for five seconds and uh, the password is of course and the consequent query that checks the password is not executed because of the comment here. In this particular case, uh, the sleep function is causing the database to pause execution for five seconds uh, before responding. If the application takes noticeably longer to respond, it indicates that the injected query is causing a delay. The attacker can then infer that the injection point is vulnerable to time-based SQL injection. Of course, this value can be changed to whatever exorbitant number you want uh, so that at least you can verify it on your end. Uh, with that being said, this video has a lab environment attached to it. Uh, the lab environment will not provide you with your own Kali Linux system, so you'll need to utilize your own. We do require the use of a web proxy like Burp Suite or OASP Zap. The reason for that is because we're going to be modifying requests and then viewing the responses and consequently the response times uh, to validate uh, or to essentially identify and uh, consequently exploit uh, blind or in this particular case time-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. So you can choose to watch the practical section before going through the lab or after. It's entirely up to you. Uh, all you need to do is fire up the lab. It'll provide you with a link to the target web application, which is a real world web application. And uh, I'm going to be utilizing my own Kali Linux VM because I have all the required tools in there. Uh, if you have a Zap or Burp Suite installed on Windows or your host operating system, that'll work just fine. Uh, with that being said, let me switch over into my Kali Linux system and we can get started. All right, I am back in my Kali Linux VM and I'm going to be utilizing Burp Suite as my web proxy of choice. So I'm just going to fire it up and I'm going to be utilizing the Burp Suite browser uh, just because it's already been pre-configured to proxy traffic uh, through Burp Suite. And I don't want to go ahead and configure my own uh, browser's uh, you know proxy uh, configuration. Uh, we'll need a web proxy because, again, as I said, we're going to be um, intercepting and, uh, again, then modifying requests and then, you know, essentially viewing the response times. So I'll head over into proxy and disable intercept for the time being and open up the Chromium browser here. There we are. And uh, I'm going to paste in the link that the lab provided to me. And uh, there we go. So paste that in. That's going to take us to the target web application, which is appears to be a medical center. Uh, web application. I can't really read Spanish, but it looks like uh, this means uh, username or authentication. And this is the demo instance. So you can access the demo by logging in as the user admin and password, which is actually great here. So the application input that's vulnerable to uh, time-based SQL injection is this login form here, where we have a username and password uh, 
form. So, you know, for example, the typical thing you would do at this point in time, if you know, if you're, uh, if you're testing for SQL injection vulnerabilities is to try the single quote. Obviously this would work because the username or the login parameter is going to be treated as a string based on the nature of the data that is going to be sent. It's uh, not likely that that's going to be an integer. So we can use the single quote here and we hit enter and it's gonna say that the password is required. I can translate a little bit here. So I'll just put in the single quote and a test password, like uh, for example, you know, just random, uh, a random string there, hit enter and we don't get an error, all right? So we're clearly not dealing with error-based SQL injection. Uh, it may have been successful, however, we weren't able to tell. So we can try something a little bit more sophisticated, like the infamous uh, or one equals one, and the password can just be password 456, and uh, we hit login. And uh, yeah, we don't get any error. The web application is less than telling with regards to how it works and uh, whether what we injected was successfully injected. So this is sort of the essence of blind SQL injection, right? And of course, we took a look at one aspect of that with uh, Boolean based SQL injection uh, in the previous video, but this is this requires a little bit more nuance. So I'm going to enable my um, I'm going to enable intercept here. And uh, we can uh, just put in, for example, admin and password, we don't really need the real credentials and log in. So there we are, we have the get, uh, actually, this is a post request, no parameters passed in the URL. However, the parameters and their values are passed in the body of the HTTP post request here. So we can send this to the repeater, where we can modify the request and uh, then send it and then view the response rapidly. So in here, what we could do now is of course try and you know put in our payload or whatever you typically be required to do uh, so what we could do to invoke uh, sleep here or the first payload we can try out with regards to blind sql injection is to get the database to sleep for 5 seconds uh, before responding so we can say or sleep uh, for 5 seconds and we'll use the uh, pound symbol here because that seems to work or maybe not but we'll perform url encoding so control plus u on your keyboard and we'll hit send and let's take a look at the response in uh, this particular case it looks like it's taking a little bit longer actually than 5 seconds so very very interesting this may be an issue with our uh, uh, with the use of the or command here. So in essence, what we're saying is if the username is not found, which we have not provided one, can you run this particular command here? So sleep for five seconds until, um, you know, and then you can respond and, or until the next request. However, this uh, usually causes issues in MySQL databases. Uh, primarily, there we are. So if you take a look at the bottom right here, Burp Suite, this is one of the great features of Burp Suite and also OWASP Zap is at the bottom, it tells you the response time in milliseconds. So one second is equal to a thousand milliseconds, which means 35,000 milliseconds equals to 35 seconds and some change. So uh, that obviously took more than five seconds. The reason it did that is again, uh, it essentially comes down to the actual um, logical operator we used here where we essentially said, you know, if one fails, don't worry, you can run the other one. And, uh, you know, if we can say, for example, and uh, one equals one, uh, or one equals two, I just want to see what this would give us. We're essentially just tearing here logical operations. Uh, the one after it sort of uh, gets uh, executed after five seconds, hopefully based on this logic but that should be 5,000 milliseconds, in this case, 260 milliseconds. So what we can do is let's set that to um, an operation that will always evaluate to uh, true. So one equals one, as we already know, and I'll URL encode this and send that over. Uh, so in this case, it's going to execute this and then the sleep for five seconds, and then it is uh, going to also execute this. So again, it should take about, you know, 35,000 milliseconds or 35 seconds. And I'm just going to wait for it to actually provide me the response. And I'll show you how we can actually verify this correctly. Because at this point, realistically speaking, we know that the sleep command is working or the sleep function is working. The only issue with it is it usually, uh, again, waits for the next request, the get request. So I think I can actually prove this to you here. Uh, there we are. So 35,000 uh, 
35,000 milliseconds, which is 35 seconds. So I'll just uh, get rid of this here and uh, we, we can just say all sleep for five seconds, right? And um, before we send it out, let me just URL encode this and uh, I'll also go into proxy and forward that request there. there okay so um key thing to note here is if we just drag this to the side i just want to see whether this will affect if we make a new uh request or we try and log in again whether the new select request will prompt it to you know limit the sleep time to only five seconds and again i said this is not something you need to worry about it's just uh something that i'm curious of at the moment so we will uh, just put in some test. Uh, actually, we'll just say Alexis and password and keep that at the ready. And we'll send this request here and we'll try and log in. Just try and log in to see whether that will invoke a response after five seconds and not any, uh, any longer. So not the entire 35 seconds. But in this case, this doesn't look like it's working and I should have actually intercepted that. Uh, or disable intercept there. So uh, in this case, it'll take the entire 35 uh, seconds. So we'll just wait for the response here. All right, we can see 35 seconds here. I just want to try something else out here. So within a new session, because these are tied to cookies, if another user is making a request, would it interrupt that particular flow? So in my version of Firefox now, I'm just going to uh, send this. And then if I make a request on the page again here, uh, that should limit it only to sleep for five seconds. So, you know, test and test and hit login, for example. There we are. Don't save. Uh, nope, still looks like it's going to take 35 seconds. So don't worry. I'm going to explain why this is happening. Um, I'm just going to wait for the response now. All right, so there we are, exactly 35,000 milliseconds. So the way this, uh, the reason this is not working is because of the logical operation here, where, as I said, um, you know, it'll not find the username because we have not provided it and it's going to run this operation and this is going to wait for the next uh, request. So uh, the way we can fix this is by saying, uh, providing a legitimate uh, option here. So we say, uh, sorry about that admin so because that we know that's a legitimate user and instead of using or we say and sleep for five seconds and one equals one all right so now this should only take five seconds and this will confirm the blind uh, time-based sql injection so pay attention to the response time it should be 5000 milliseconds and some change so i'll hit send All right, there we are. So 5,262 milliseconds. And now the payload is working as intended. We can change it to 10 seconds and that would be 10,000 milliseconds. So we'll just run this second test here. So this again proves that this uh, login form is indeed vulnerable to SQL injection, more specifically blind time-based SQL injection, and also to a certain extent, Boolean-based injection. So there we are, 10,260 milliseconds. So again, this all comes down to the actual um, payload itself and what we were essentially asking here of the database. So we're saying uh, admin, that's true. Um, so in pretty much when utilizing the AND operator here, uh, all or both of the options or queries, or in this case, functions and operations need to be correct. Uh, so in this case, admin is a legitimate user. So it says, okay. Uh, I also need to execute this. So sleep for five seconds and then, you know, one equals one. So it sleeps for five seconds and then, you know, also executes one equals one. And, uh, you know, it does it in uh, five seconds as requested. So this confirms that, uh, you know, there is a blind time-based SQL injection vulnerability here. And from this point on, you can now move on to the exploitation phase. However, I really want to focus on some of the other, you know, time-based payloads you can utilize. Uh, not uh, limited to, you know, just the sleep uh, function, which again can be a little bit tricky to use. A much better one that I like is the ability to uh, perform a benchmark where you can tell SQL 
uh, or in this case, really the back, uh, the d database management system, which is, uh, and this particular command or function is available in most mice, uh, most SQL databases or relational databases that utilize SQL as their primary language, uh, where we can essentially say, right over here, admin, and I'll just get rid of that here. We can say admin, um, single quote, or um, we can then say benchmark, and we can get it to perform some, um, uh, you know, we can pretty much get it to calculate, to perform some calculations. So there's multiple stuff that we can do. We can tell it to encode it, uh, to encode a specific string of text a certain amount of times, which will take uh, some time, right, obviously. So for example, we can say or benchmark, uh, and in here we can put in uh, maybe, you know, a thousand times, uh, we want you to encode uh, the string hello and um, yeah, I think that should be good and we'll close that here and we'll put in the comment or the pound symbol and let's control, let's encode that there. And let's send it over. Now based on the encoding uh, that you specify, it'll obviously take a short amount of time or a long uh, amount of time, right? So. In this case, we'll have to use and because admin is a real user, I forgot to do that. So I'll say send that executed relatively fast. So I'll increase this. So let's go uh, 10,000. Actually, let's go 100,000 times or iterations. In this case, it looks like there's an issue with our query. So um, what I'm going to do now is uh, let's change this here to um, actually let's unencode this and uh, we can actually get rid of that there we can say or benchmark a thousand times in this case we can increase that a little bit encode the word hello or the string hello there uh, and uh, let's try the delimiter maybe that's what's causing the issue there so control u to encode url encode specifically in this case uh, yeah it didn't look like it did anything there query was passed in successfully so Maybe we can try and comment this here. There we are. And control U and we'll hit send. Okay, so 340 milliseconds. Let's increase this to Alexis or something a bit longer like, um, let's see. Uh, um, it's the only word I can think of at the moment, but let's send that over. Yeah, so that's really not working. And this is why I said you need to make sure you're monitoring standard response times and uh, anomalous response times. So uh, the way th I think uh, the way we can make this work uh, because of I think how this is structured is let's just say in this case admin and uh, I will uh, get rid of the remainder of the payload here and we can say or benchmark and in this case let's try a traditional one so we can say you know 100 uh, 100 thousand or actually a million um, times i want you to md5 encode the following so in this case we just say one and then uh, we can use the comment there so actually let's change this to and because admin is uh, exists so control U to encode and we'll hit send. And there we are. So that looked like it worked. So 589 milliseconds. If we increase this to, uh, we can say, you know, if we change this to five, uh, I think that'll take a bit longer. Actually not longer. Uh, let's increase this value here to by one more zero and hit send. Yep, that's going to take much longer now. So there we are, that took four seconds. Uh, we can obviously, you know, put in some more here. So, you know, 125, for example. So we just increase the number of iterations and that calculation will take longer and therefore delay the execution of the query uh, and uh, consequently the response. So that proves again that SQL injection is, or this particular application input, the login form is indeed vulnerable to SQL injection. So that was four seconds or 4,000 milliseconds and we'll submit that. This will take maybe seven seconds, I think. We'll see, or eight seconds. Uh, so five seconds, all right. Uh, we can increase this to maybe, 
maybe something like that. Let's see what uh, we can actually maybe put in another five here just to make it a little bit higher in terms of the number of iterations. And you don't want to set this too high because this can cause uh, delays or even longer delays. But there we are, you can see that's six seconds. So now I've run multiple tests to prove that the higher the number of iterations, the longer the calculation time and consequently the longer the response time, which ultimately verifies that we do have a blind um, time-based SQL injection vulnerability. And uh, our SQL query or payload is being successfully executed by the database. Uh, the other option that you have, of course, is um, uh, is the ability to utilize the wait for delay option, um, which again is really not that difficult to use uh, with regards to you know whether you're dealing with a string, whether you're dealing with string based injection or string based parameter or an integer based uh, based parameter. Uh, the way this would work is, and I think I showed you guys this in the um finding sql injection vulnerabilities manually video uh but what we'll do is let's get rid of this particular payload here and we say admin and um and in this particular case we can say um, let's see um actually i don't think we need to do that but we could say for example um and Actually, I think we can just say wait for delay. So wait, uh, wait for delay, and we can specify now a proper time. So we can say zero zero five seconds, and we'll use the comment there. Uh, let's see if this works. I doubt it's going to work, but uh, we'll need to modify or play around with it a little bit. So send that over. Yeah, so that's uh, not working. So let's play around with this payload here. So. Um, we can try including a uh, bracket there and let's try and encode this again. So control U, send that over. So yeah, nothing changed there. I'm just going to get rid of that comment there and uh, control U here, send that over. It should respond in five seconds. So this is how you test whether your payloads are working. You can see that when there's no execution, it takes about 250 milliseconds uh, to respond, which again is exp uh, you know expected. Um, what we can do is uh, let's see. I'm trying to find a way to make this particular payload work, and uh, I think the best way we can go about doing that is let's just try and bring this here. So we say. Um, wait for delay and then uh, let's encode if we need to add a comment we will do that so we are send uh, so that's 254 milliseconds or so no change there and uh, we'll add the comment there sorry that's the wrong position but after the single quote there and um, there we go control u let's send that over still not working might be down to the use of single quotes here. Um, I think that might cause an issue, but hey, let's try it out. There we are, control U, send, and we're looking for a response of five seconds, which we don't get. So we can try other ones, but I think in this case, what we want to do is uh, let us stick with the single quote here. And um, we will instead of using the pound symbol let's try and use the double hyphen or double dash and uh, control u and we want to send that over so still nothing uh, just about finding the correct payload to utilize um, maybe uh, we can uh, put this juxtaposed against that uh, which would then force it to execute it control u send that over nothing so let me try a couple of them um, let us try and uh, get rid of the single quote here and uh, we'll add a space there so we terminate and then wait for delay um, we may need to uppercase this but I think this should work um, so let's see this here control U um, and we will send that over so nothing yet and uh, let's send that over now as is or so nothing there and you know even if we did not so let's say wait for 
Um, actually, that is uh, yeah. There might be certain cases. So wait uh, for and then the delay. Uh, depending on the SQL version being used, uh, we can try this out here. Okay, nothing there. Wait for delay. Um, let me try this here. So again, it's all about testing. Let's see what's going to work. And uh, the payload that uh, definitely works here is uh, this one uh, right over here, where uh, we could actually try and modify. I'll actually show it to you with a fake user. So let's see if that actually uh, makes it a delay for 30 seconds, because in this case, the sleep duration is set to 10 seconds, but the time uh, or wait for uh, time or wait for delay payload doesn't seem to be working on this particular version um of uh, my sequel at least in this particular case but there's uh, other payloads that i wanted to touch on that i'll get to shortly that would allow you to for example uh perform you know database version enumeration similar to what we did in the previous video uh where we uh you know we're essentially trying to identify whether you know version 5 uh, whether we had uh you know my sequel version 5 etc but uh, yeah this will take uh arguably much longer, uh, given that we're utilizing a the or statement here. Um, so we'll just give it a couple of seconds till it's done. There we are about um, 70 seconds. Now there's obviously another one that we can utilize here, another, another payload. So I'm just going to get rid of that here. We'll provide a legitimate user, or in this case, we don't really, because uh, we can just say, you know, fake and uh, I'm just going to paste that in here. So, or if the, in this case, we're just trying to confirm whether the, the database is indeed uh, running um, MySQL version five, similar to what we did, as I said, in the previous, in the previous video, when you're taking a look at Boolean based injection. So we send, um, and I'm going to wait for the result here. So um, there we are. So seven seconds, five, one, one, and two. So this looks like it is indeed running version five. We can obviously modify this here. So we'll say send to four, and there we are. So however, if we change it back to five, based on the time taken to execute, it'll execute the sleep uh, operation or function. And it'll, it looks like in this case, it takes about seven seconds. So just give it a couple here. And uh, yeah looks like that is the case so seven seconds and that's how you know you can confirm what version of mysql or the database really uh, the dbms is running in this case we know that the first character of the version info uh, is uh, is five because we you know just equated that there and if that's the case it's to sleep uh, as you can see here taking the first value of the character which is five and uh, then that's set to two, which is seven, which makes sense. So that's seven seconds, uh, which uh, again, is fairly uh, easy or simple to understand. Um, so again, you can definitely go through this, uh, there's tons of payloads you can run with regards to time based uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities. And uh, that is going to uh, bring us to the end of the practical section of this video. All right, so that brings us to the end of the blind SQL injection section of this course, where we've uh, been able to take uh, a look at both in-band um, SQL injection vulnerabilities, as well as the respective subtypes, that being or those being error-based SQL injection, union-based SQL injection, and then we turned our attention to blind uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities, where we took a look at the, again, respective subtypes, uh, those being Boolean based SQL injection, more specifically, blind Boolean based SQL injection. And uh, obviously, in this video, we have just concluded our uh, exploration of time based SQL injection vulnerabilities, we're now going to turn our attention to the final section of this course, 
where we will be exploring uh, the fundamentals of NoSQL injection or essentially NoSQL databases and uh, the consequent uh, injection of uh, NoSQL databases. With that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next section. No SQL or no SQL fundamentals. So welcome everyone to the no uh, SQL injection section of this course. Now this is uh, going to be the final section of this course and I would typically consider it to be a bonus section. Uh, the reason for that is obviously uh, primarily because we'll not be diving too deep into no SQL injection. I added it here as sort of a primer because we'll be exploring it later on uh, in even in more advanced web application penetration testing certification. So in the beginning of the course, when we were talking about databases, I briefly introduced you to NoSQL databases and showed you how they uh, operate or how they work in relation to your standard SQL or relational databases. So in this video, what I'm going to do is again, reintroduce you to NoSQL databases and sort of cover uh, pretty much everything that you need to know or the essentials. And then uh, we'll also be taking a look at a practical live lab uh, where we will be interacting with a MongoDB server or MongoDB as it were to show you uh, how it differs, uh, you know, from a typical uh, or how it differs to a typical relational database with regards uh, not only to its structure, but also the commands or the queries that you can run. So to begin with, uh, what is NoSQL or a NoSQL database? Well, NoSQL databases, also known as not only SQL databases, are a class of database management systems that provide a non-relational approach uh, for storing and retrieving data. Unlike traditional relational databases, which organize data into tables with predefined schemas, as we have been able to see, NoSQL databases offer more flexible data models, which are useful in certain cases, that can handle unstructured, semi-structured, and rapidly evolving data. NoSQL databases emerged as a response to the need for scalability, performance, and agility in handling modern data types and workloads. Now I can't, or I will not dive into the um, the nitty gritty of you know the advantages of NoSQL databases and their deployment models, or the deployment environments where you typically see them deployed over relational databases. But the primary uh, the primary reason why uh, some uh, developers or some companies utilize NoSQL database uh, databases is primarily based on the type of data they're storing. If it's you know typically rapidly changing. Uh, and secondly, uh, for scalability, as I've just shown, and I'll explain the scalability aspect in a few seconds. So when you talk about NoSQL databases, the important thing to note is that there are types of NoSQL databases. Now, this list is by no means comprehensive. This is just uh, the common ones, or these are examples of the common ones that you will see. So the first and the most popular are key value stores, right? So these databases store data as a collection of key value pairs. The value can be any type of data such as text, JSON, or binary objects. Examples of key value store databases include Redis, uh, React, and Amazon DynamoDB. Redis being the most popular of them all, and we'll touch on Redis shortly. We then have document databases, which is what we're going to be taking a look at in the practical demo. So document databases store and retrieve data in JSON-like documents, and documents can vary in structure, and the database provides features for querying and indexing based on the document's content. MongoDB and Couchbase serve our popular document databases. We then have columnar uh, databases. Columnar databases organize data into columns rather than rows making them efficient for analytical workloads and handling large volumes of data. Examples of these are Apache Cassandra and Apache HBase. All right, so those are the primary types. Now, that brings us to the critical uh, point here, uh, and that is what is the difference between a traditional SQL relational database or uh, and a, no, uh, a NoSQL database? Well, firstly, uh, we have the type, right? So in this particular case, SQL databases are most likely going to be relational and NoSQL databases are not relational or none 
uh, are non-relational. And I explained uh, how relational databases work, so I'll not dive into that right now. As for the data storage model, you can see that uh, in SQL databases, you typically have tables with fixed rows and columns. In NoSQL databases, the, the data uh, storage model is typically unstructured. Uh, there's storage in JSON files, and uh, you know there's typically use of key value pairs. So you know tables and rows with dynamic columns, as you'll see once we get started. As for the database schema, with SQL databases, you typically see that there's static or rigid schema, uh, which means you're very uh, less likely to change uh, or are pretty much static because of their relational uh, nature or the relational nature of the of the actual data. Uh, with NoSQL databases, the schema is dynamic or flexible for obvious reasons because uh, you know data is rapidly changing. The structure of rows and uh, in this particular columns is dynamic, so as a result, the schema needs to be dynamic or flexible. Now, this is the key point here, and that's scalability. So, with SQL databases, it's vertical scalability where you need to increase resources, uh, physical or hardware resources you know, in order to scale performance. With NoSQL databases, it's horizontal scaling. As for the language, uh, you know, SQL databases is fairly simple. Uh, you know, it utilizes the structured query language as we've been able to see. Uh, with the NoSQL database, it's uh, the unstructured query language. Uh, typically, the NoSQL databases that I've just uh, highlighted the examples of, which we'll take a look at shortly, usually have their own query language in some cases and also have some uh, the capability for you know uh, boolean or logical operations which we'll also highlight and that's where the whole no sql injection comes into play uh, we've talked about the schema but i wanted to dive deeper a little bit into that or a little more into that where you, to sort of highlight what i was talking about but the with sql databases the um, schema is bound to the relationship or relationships and NoSQL uh, you know, databases typically have a non-rigid schema. As for the query complexity, this is where you factor in the query language. Uh, so in the case of the structured query language, as you're able to tell, uh, it supports really complex queries that can you know, perform multiple things at one go, where you can combine uh, different queries into one and you know, combine the results uh, you know, from, you know, let's say, a select statement using the union operator, so on and so forth. So it supports really complex queries. Uh, the disadvantage with NoSQL databases is while you know, databases or NoSQL databases like MongoDB have their own query language, they don't really support advanced or complex queries in the same way that a SQL database would, um, you know, given the fact that it's relational. So they support some really cool uh, queries and some, some really advanced operations, but uh, not to the level that you would see with a standard SQL database. So those are the key differences between the two types here. And again, I've not gone over, you know, all of them with regards to the technical stuff, because I don't think that that's really important at this phase. Uh, but this is what I'm referring to typically. So, you know, if we take a look at uh, on the left here, we have a standard SQL relational database where you have, a, you know, columns and rows and the column uh, refers to the attribute and uh, the, the rows uh, refer to records, right? So uh, particular entries uh, with a, a NoSQL database like uh, MongoDB, where you have uh, documents or the use of documents or records as it were, uh, you can see that data is stored in documents and its key value. So prop one and then the data and the data could consist of multiple fields, but we'll get to that. And that's how it's stored. Uh, and, you know, you may be asking yourself, why would you want to do that? As I said, I'm not really going to dive deep into why you would want to use one over the other, uh, because, again, that would go over the scope of this course. But this is essentially the, the difference between them. So. Uh, it's very important that you keep this in mind. Uh, now, of course, we've talked a lot about this, but what are the most popular NoSQL databases that you'll run into when performing a web app pen test? And of course, this is by no means comprehensive. Just from my experience, you'll typically find MongoDB being used quite a lot. So MongoDB, as I've stated before, is a document database that stores data in flexible JSON-like documents, and it provides high scalability automatic sharding and a powerful query language uh, called the uh, Mongo query language or MQL, which I'll actually be helping you with or helping you understand shortly. 
We then have Cassandra. Apache Cassandra is a distributed columnar database designed to handle large amounts of data across multiple uh, commodity servers. It offers high availability, fault tolerance, and a linear scalability. We then have Redis, which again is very popular. Redis is an in-memory key value store that can be used as a database cache or message broker. It's typically used as a cache or message broker, and it supports a wide range of data structures and provides high performance and low latency. Now, this brings us to the NoSQL database query language or what language NoSQL databases utilize. Now, NoSQL databases typically have their own query languages or interfaces for data retrieval and manipulation. And here are some examples of query languages used in popular NoSQL databases. So as I've said, in the case of MongoDB, it utilizes a query language called the MongoDB query language, also known as MQL. And it provides a rich set of operators and functions for querying and manipulating documents in the database. Not as extensive as the structured query language, but still pretty powerful. We then have Redis. Uh, Redis is primarily an in-memory data structure store and does not have a traditional query language. It provides a set of commands that operate on, a di on different data structures like strings, lists, sets, and hashes. Uh, Redis commands are typically used to perform operations such as reading and writing data, data manipulation, and data expiration. So essentially modification of the data store. And that brings us to the, uh, the practical section of this, uh, of this uh, video, where we'll be interacting with a MongoDB server. And I'll be showing you some a uh, little bit of the Mongo query language and how you can sort of navigate around the database. So you have an understanding, at least at, uh, at a fundamental level of how NoSQL databases work, primarily how they store data. So I'm not gonna you know, highlight the syntax in the slides because as I said, this is not really important at this phase. I just want to introduce you to NoSQL injection. And we start off by understanding how these databases work uh, with regards to the actual database itself. So this lab will provide you with a terminal session where we'll be able to immediately interact with the MongoDB server. So you don't need to use uh, your own Kali Linux system. We don't need to use any other tools. Uh, we'll just get started. And uh, again, you can go through uh, the video first. I would highly recommend that you do that. However, if you're familiar with uh, the Mongo query language, you can go through the lab and then go through the video or the practical section of this video. With that being said, let me start up the lab and uh, switch over and uh, we can get started. All right, so I am back within the lab environment and this is the lab environment you'll be provided with in a browser tab. It'll provide you with a web SSH session on a uh, as the, the user student. So this uh, this particular Linux server already has a MongoDB or a MongoDB server running. And uh, to, in order to interact with the MongoDB server, we simply need to type in Mongo and hit enter and it's going to open up the MongoDB shell. And from this point, we can get started. Now, the most important uh, command here is going to be the help command. If you're ever lost with regards to commands or queries, just open it up and uh, you can see that you can also utilize the db.help uh, command right over here to get help on db methods. Uh, you can also uh, utilize the dbmycollection.help command here, which will give you help on collection methods. Now I'll explain what collections are because I think this is uh, quite important. Uh, you can list out the databases, collections, uh, users, the profile, the logs, etc. So very, very simple to use. Uh, not simple in a bad way, but uh, just really functional. Now, we need to understand a few concepts here. When we refer to a database, this is very similar to a SQL database. We're referring to an actual database, okay? So if we say, for example, here, uh, show DBS, right? And uh, in this particular case, it's typically recommended that you uh, you pretty much end your queries with the uh, uh, the actual semicolon as you would do with uh, you know the structured query language. But you can just hit enter, and that's going to show you your databases. So we have uh, various databases here that look like they're storing different types of data. So we have one called admin, city, flag, local, stats, and users. Now it's after this point when you go into each database that things change from a standard relational database or a SQL database. So if I was to navigate into a database, uh, you know, uh, let's say in MySQL, what I would be greeted with at that point is tables. All right. Now, what you'll be greeted with in the case of MongoDB is something called a collection. All right. 
Now, a collection is a grouping of documents inside the database. It's pretty much uh, the same thing or similar to a table in SQL, and it stores, uh, you know, different types of data, you know, uh, based on its data type. You know, it, uh, essentially what you do with a, re a relational database. So uh, we can go ahead and list out the collections, but I'll show you how, you know, we would typically go through this. Uh, the first thing you need to know how to do is obviously to uh, to actually select a particular database. And then uh, we can say, for example, in this case, uh, let's try and use the user's database or interact with it. In order to do that, we say use and uh, we then say users or the actual name of the database. So there we, uh, is going to say switch to DB users. And then we can say show collections. Uh, and that's the equivalent of show tables. And there we are. So we can see that in this particular database called users, we have the following collections. We have band, current and past. All right. So this makes sense. This, uh, this particular database looks like it's storing, uh, user information. And within the database, we have, uh, collections or tables that, uh, will probably have band users, current users and past users. Right. So, um, let's go through some practical examples. Um, and I'm going to, you know, of course, this particular lab will have a set of questions and I'm going to help you answer them. So the first question is, you know, how we can find information, um, you know, so what I'm going to do is I'll say show DBS and uh, you can see we have a database called flag here. So I'm going to say use flag and uh, we can say show, you know, collections in this particular database. And now what we can do is if we wanted to find, um, you know, the value of a flag from within that particular, uh, from this particular collection, as it were, uh, or from this particular database and collection, what we could do is say, you know, DB dot flag, uh, sorry, DB dot flag. And then we say find, all right. So, uh, put in a two, uh, or put in a, your brackets here, we hit enter. And what it's going to do is it's going to find um, the value of the flag that, uh, you know, obtained from the MongoDB cluster. All right. Now, um, we can switch into that particular collection. And, uh, you know, for example, in this case, we're just using the, the query language, the Mongo query language here to find the flag. But if we say, uh, you know, show collections once more, show collections, and we say in this case, um, let's see, uh, use flag. Uh, or we can just, you know, in this case, um, you know, in order to view it, we can just say DB dot flag and then display the, the actual flag. So if we say DB dot flag, uh, in this particular case, you can use the auto completion here to display other commands. So, uh, for example, we can find which you've already done. Uh, you can also aggregate, uh, count, etc. So let's take a look at some of these really interesting commands we can run. So, uh, if we go back, uh, to, if we say show DBS, if we go to the user's database and uh, we um, let's try and find a particular user, right? In this particular case, the question is asking us to find a, um, to find a particular user. So for example, how would we do that? So, you know, if we say show collections, we don't need to go into any of them, but we could say db.current dot find and then in uh, brackets we can uh, open up brackets here and then use curly braces and say the user field um what we want to do is find a particular user that matches let's say alexis right and uh, we can then close the curly braces here and hit enter now it doesn't find a user called alexis but let's try another user and in this case i can say for example find the user heather uh, no match because this is case sensitive. So let's try that with an uppercase H. There we are. So we're able to find a particular, we're able to find a particular user. Now let me walk you through how you can view, um, how you can view data stored within collections. So if you wanted to list, uh, you know, the actual documents within a particular collection, what you can do is again, let's start off from the beginning, show databases, and let's say use the, the database called the users. And we, we say show collections here. So I'm going to say show collections and we have, let's say current ones, right? So let's say db dot, uh, users dot, uh, find, and then uh, sorry, let me type that in correctly here. db.users.find, uh, in this particular case, we would put in the collection name. So we would say current users. 
current users, and there we are. So this is the data stored within that particular uh, collection, right? Or the data stored within that particular, uh, the documents rather, as it were, stored within that particular collection. So in here, we can see now the individual data, which is key value, and uh, there's multiple fields here. So, you know, if I was to zoom out and display this, so it's displayed or rendered correctly, I can hit enter. You can see that we have the ID, our object ID, and then the user, uh, the, the actual name here, their join date, their email, etc. So very similar to a relational database. So I just want to go through that again, because it can be quite difficult to understand the ab abstraction. So we have uh, databases, right? Databases are just the same as they are in a relational database. They store tables or in this case, collections. All right. So if we say uh, use a particular database like users. Um, we can now say show collections, the equivalent of saying show tables. So show, uh, essentially, in NoSQL databases, collections are just tables, right? And collections are a collection of documents, right? And documents store, you know, specific data, right? So for example, in this particular case, um, you know, if we wanted to find out, for example, there's another, you know, command we can run. So we can say uh, db.past or band users. So we can say db.band uh, dot find. And uh, we then say dot count to show, you know, the total number of band users or entries within that particular um, within that particular collection, it'll show us the amount of documents. So we'll hit enter. So there are 91 documents. So a document in this case is what you typically consider a record. So if we go back to the previous command here, where we listed out the, uh, the current, uh, the actual, uh, content of the, uh, current collection, you can see that these here are all entries, but they're all individual documents. All right. So for every user here, uh, these are all individual documents. And uh, there's a good reason why this is done or this uh, method of storing data is preferred. Now, uh, as I said, there's multiple types of queries we can uh, perform. And uh, what we can do is let's say show collections. We can say uh, in this particular case, uh, db.band.find. Um, db let's see what users have been banned. Uh, Band.find. Uh, you can see these are all the band users here, and these are all documents. So we can try and perform some additional queries. Uh, you know, if we were interested in finding some particular information, uh, which I just showed you how to do. So for example, if I said uh, uh, db.band.find, I could uh, in here put in my query or the criteria, right? So I would say for the field, uh, for the field user, can you find a user with the following value? So we'll say user. And uh, this is where we got the, that criteria early on. We can say find a user called Mona, which I know exists. And uh, we just hit enter and there we are. So it's going to give us that particular document, right? And again, you can do this for any of the, uh, for any of the fields here. Um, so for example, uh, we could again, search for emails or phone numbers, so on and so forth. And based on this, you can see how this is, uh, how this is useful because this simple query can, you know, find data. And then it refers to the actual document storing the data and also lists out the data within the document. Right. So pretty cool. So again, we can change that to something like, uh, for example, uh, if we said, um, Hmm, let's see phone. Or let's try, uh, yeah, let's use phone. And, you know, in this case, we put in a wrong phone number. So let's say someone was trying to log in, a better option might be their email. Uh, the query would be something that checks for this particular value within uh, the, the current user collection, uh, not the band one, but there we are. So, you know, we can say Alexis at INE.com. And uh, let me type that in correctly here. And I'll just zoom out because this is too zoomed in. Hit enter so it doesn't find anything. Now, I've already shown you how to, you know, identify the, so if I say db.band, um, db.band.count, that's to tell the total number uh, of records, or in the case of a NoSQL database, the total number of documents within a particular collection, 91. If we say db.current, uh, we can see the current users um, or the documents within that collection. So very, very simple to understand.
right? Now, um, what if we wanted to identify uh, or check, you know, how many, and I'll go back to the database here, I'll list all the databases. Let's utilize the city, the city database here. So city, uh, we show the collections. There we are, we have city there. So we can say db.city, but uh, we can say db.find, uh, db actually, uh, db.city.find uh, to list out the documents here. You can see these are all the, the actual records or documents. So we have multiple fields. We have the ID, the city, uh, the location, which points to latitude and longitude uh, coordinates, and then uh, population and the state. All right. So what if we wanted to find, uh, you know, how many of these documents uh, and I'm referring to the number, how many of these documents all have this, the state of, let's say, um, in, in this case, MA, which I'm assuming is Massachusetts, I might be wrong, but let's try and do that. The way we would do this, would, we would say is uh, city db.city.find, and then in here, we would put in our parameters or criteria. So the field in this case is city, and then we would say that's going to be equal to MA or just MA as it were, and we'll close the curly braces and then the count, right? So that'll tell us how many uh, documents here um, essentially meet that criteria. We'll hit zero. So we essentially what we did is, you know, we found out how many uh, cities uh, of the state Massachusetts are present in the collection city uh, in the database city, right? So a little bit abstract, but that's how that would work. And you can again utilize any field uh, to perform your queries there. Uh, we could also do this to, you know, for example, the um, the population field seems interesting. And this is where I wanted to show you the logical operators uh, in uh, the uh, Mongo query language. So for example, uh, we can try and find out how many cities have a population greater than let's say 15,000 in the collection city in the database city. To do that, we would say uh, use city. We currently are using that. Um, we are using that database. And now if we say show collections, we only have one collection called city. Again, we can say db.city.find uh, and we can then utilize the field population. So it needs to match exactly population. And then we say in here, when we utilize a uh, logical operation, we can utilize the dollar symbol and we say GT, which stands for greater than. There's also not equal to or equal to, which I'll also show you in the next video and we'll be talking about injection or no SQL injection, but we then say the value here. So 15,000 and uh, yeah, so we'll close this curly brace, uh, the original one and then the, uh, the actual bracket there. So essentially saying, can you find uh, can you find uh, how many cities have a population greater than 15,000 in the collection city, in the database city? And then we say, count this. Can you tell us the total number here? So 5,785 cities. Um, and, you know, we can change this. So we can say how many cities have a population greater than, let's say, um, 100,000. Only four of them. All right. So that's uh that's how this works now if we get rid of count it'll actually show us those cities so in this case new york brooklyn chicago as you can see here which is pretty cool so uh, you're starting to get a feel as to why some web applications need this type of database as opposed to a relational database so it all comes down to uh you know what a type of data you're going to be storing and how fast you need to access it right now we can also run some advanced ones. So for example, we can say how many cities in the state of, uh, let's say, uh, let's say New York have a, um, you know, maybe we can say population, but let's try a different one. So we can say uh, db.city.find. Um, let's see what other states we have here. So we have, uh, uh, we need to type in IT to display the others. So IT, we're pretty much seeing just Massachusetts. Um, let's see, um, Massachusetts still. Uh, we can say db.city.find. Um, 
let's see if we can find whether there's other states here. Uh, so I'm going to say in here, uh, we'll just put in uh, state and I'll say the state equals something like uh, FL for Florida and we'll close that up there and uh, let's hit enter. So there we are, Florida as an example. So we can say db.city.find and in here, now coming back to utilizing a different uh, or a logical operator, to use the logical operator like we did in the structured query language, instead of saying and or typing it out, we use the dollar symbol and then we say and and then we use a, uh, a colon and then specify our set here. So we're saying and uh, we want to find a population greater than, so we're going to say um, within this set, we'll just say population, that's going to be greater than, so GT, and then the value, so let's say, you know, uh, 15,000, for example, and we'll close those two curly braces there, and then the second operation, which is going to be the state, so the second match, in this case, let's say the state is Florida, so FL for Florida, and uh, we'll close the curly braces there, and uh, we then need to close the single uh, bracket or the standard bracket and then uh, normal bracket, and then we say count, right? Hit enter. So you can see this is a pretty advanced query. Uh, we're looking for very specific information here, and let's see uh, whether it can give us that information. So we're asking it to tell us db.city.find. Um, can you please um, tell us the, or run the operation where the first uh, option is the population needs to be uh, greater than 15,000. Secondly, uh, it needs to uh, essentially tell us the how many cities in the state of Florida have a population greater than 15,000 in the collection city and the database city. So I'll hit enter. This is taking a while. I don't think it actually, uh, we actually got a result. So let's try a different state here. Um, that operation did not run successfully. So let's try and copy this here. Just going to copy this and uh, paste that in there. Uh, we can change this to maybe, let's, let's say New York, for example hit enter. So for some reason that's uh, not displaying that, let's try a different one. Um, one that might work here. Actually, what we could do is um, if we try and let me just paste in the query. So um, actually, hold on, let me just terminate that there. Let's go back into Mongo show DBS. Um, and we'll say uh, use uh, city. And then we say show collections. I'm going to use that same query here. So if I run that again, let's see if we get any result from this. We may need to change the greater than here because they might not be city. Uh, well, I assume they are, uh, but they only might be a few uh, documents uh, with the state of Florida or that have the field, uh, the field of state that's equal to Florida or FL as it were. So um, we'll just give it a few seconds here. Um, let's try a different one, maybe something like uh, Indiana, so IN, or we can try MA here as we did Massachusetts. Uh, that actually should work because we're just checking population and then greater than, yeah, 15,000. That should work. And then the second operation is state, uh, which is Massachusetts here. And uh, Oh, there we are. I think I found out why my my query wasn't working. That's because of my syntax. I forgot to close the actual curly braces here. So if we hit enter now, there we are 378. So that took a while. So our initial query worked. So three, 378 um, cities in the state of Florida have a population greater than uh, 15,000 in the collection city in the database city. If we get rid of the count operator there, it'll display them for us. And uh, yeah, so you, you're sort of getting the hang of things here now. Um, I also want to show you the, uh, the logical operator or and how to use that. So we can ask ourselves the question, how many cities have a population less than 100 or belong to the state of Florida or something like that? So to do this, we would say uh, db.city. Uh, let me type that in. So db.city.find. 
And in here we can say, um, um, for example, let's see, or, so we'll say or, uh, and then we put in the, the actual criteria. Whenever utilizing a logical operator, you put in the logical operator, then the criteria. So we're saying either one of them can be correct. If either one of them is correct, display the results. So in here we'll say uh, population is going to be, and then we'll open up here. Um, to say is less than, um, we can say IT. So IT is another logical operator here. And then we set that to 100. Um, actually, not IT, LT, sorry. That's my bad. So LT. Um, and we say 100. And then um, we can say in here, put in the state. And uh, that's going to be equal to Florida, so FL, and uh, yeah, so we'll close the first uh, bracket here, and then of course we need to close the uh, the square bracket, and then the curly braces again for the initial set there, and then the uh, primary bracket there, and we say count. So one four nine nine. So in, in essence. Uh, how many cities have a population less than 100 or uh, belong uh, to the state uh, of Florida in the collection city, in the database city. So uh, we've talked about and, or, uh, and less than, greater than, etc. So, you know, these would typically be, so greater than in this case is just uh, dollar symbol GT, uh, less than is just dollar symbol LT, um, the or operator is just or, uh, and then we have, of course, uh, and, and we also have not. So that's, uh, you know, how we can run, uh, run these uh, logical operators. Um, we can also utilize rejects. That's one of the great things with uh, the uh, NoSQL or the Mongo query language, as it were. The way we can do this is, let's say we want to find uh, cities that uh, have their names starting with, uh, let's say, um, hmm, let's see, um, hmm, let's see, city starting with, uh, let's try NE, okay, that might be interesting, so we can say, um, um, let's say use city, we're currently using city here, just trying to think of how we can run the query, so we'll say db.city.find, and in here we'll uh, say the, we'll open up brackets and in here we'll say the city field is, um, we're going to need to utilize rejects. So we'll open up uh, curly brackets here and we'll say uh, dollar symbol rejects. And then we say rejects is going to be um, hmm. so um n e actually no that might not work uh let's just try uh, i'm just trying to think here we put in the reject so starts with and then uh, we can say for example uh let's say uh Hmm. Um, so if we take a look at this here, the city is in capital. So we could say, uh, so uh, let's try HA, for example, just as an example, and then we'll use wildcard there. And uh, we'll close the curly brackets here and then the single, uh, the primary bracket as it were, and we'll just uh, list them out. So uh, looks like we have an issue with our query. So that's this one here, this one here, db.city.find, and we close that there, rejects, HA. You may have an issue with our rejects here. Uh, let's try H, uh, unterminated string literal. That's interesting. Uh, so I put, oh, there we are. Okay, my bad, I uh, did not put the double quotes there. There we are. So anything starting with H is going to be listed here. Uh, you can use rejects to do that, again, depending on what you want to do. So for example, we can say, uh, in this case, uh, we say HO, will that display Houston? Uh, no, 
we don't have that at least in this uh, data set or collection if we try for example mi for miami uh, we should see a match there for miami hopefully uh, if it's been added uh, so we only have milan uh, nothing else so uh, let's try um, um hmm, let's try something else uh, let's see sa San uh, Saint Francis. So these are just cities. Sanco, Sanford. All right. So you get the idea. You can also utilize rejects. Um, and I've al already shown you the logical operators uh, and what we can do there. Uh, we can also perform mathematical operations, which is going to be the final example here that I'll show you. So while still working in the city uh, database and the city collection, what if we wanted to find the average? Uh, population. To do that, we would say db.city.aggregate, uh, uh, db.city.aggregate, and then we'll put in here the uh, group, we'll utilize the group functionality. So we'll, this is used to group uh, data uh, documents rather within a collection. And then we'll say in here, um, we'll say the ID. So ID, there's the field we want here. Um, actually, we need to put that in double quotes. So we'll say ID. Uh, and then we're going to say null um, average. So AVG. And then in here, uh, let's see. Um, what I want specifically is to We'll need to utilize the average operator so avg and then in here we would put in the parameter or the field here so just population and then we would close that one there the primary one and uh, the tertiary, uh, secondary and tertiary um, bracket and then in here we can just hit enter and uh, string literal again so uh, group yeah i forgot to put this here in double quotes hit enter so the average in this particular case is 8462 which is uh, interesting so uh there we are that's how to uh you know perform an average um on an aggregate of uh, documents as it were within a particular collection uh with that being said that is the mongo query language in a nutshell i've not covered everything but hopefully this will give you an understanding as to how this differs from the structured query language um, and uh, with that being said that's going to conclude the practical demonstration side of this video all right so that was an introduction to nosql databases and uh, we got an understanding as, as to the differences between SQL databases and NoSQL databases, examples of, of NoSQL databases, how they work with regards to how they store data. And we also took a look at a very popular NoSQL database called MongoDB, as well as how to use it or interact with it using the Mongo query language or MQL. Uh, in the next video, we're going to be taking a look at a practical example uh, of what NoSQL injection looks like, primarily on MongoDB. Uh, with that being said, I'll be seeing you in the next video. MongoDB NoSQL Injection. In this video, we're going to be getting an introduction as to what NoSQL Injection is, after which we'll get a theoretic example as to what goes on uh, with regards to a web application and its uh, relationship or how it communicates with a NoSQL database. And that'll sort of give us enough information to go ahead and identify and exploit a NoSQL injection vulnerability, specifically in MongoDB. So this video will have, uh, will have a lab environment attached to it. Uh, that will essentially provide you with a target web application that is utilizing MongoDB. However, before we get to the lab, there's a couple of things I need to clarify, right? So firstly, this is really our first foray into NoSQL injection, but the process uh, in comparison to SQL injection remains the same. The only thing that changes is really the 
the queries or the payloads uh, that you, you specify or that you inject. So what is NoSQL injection? NoSQL injection is a security vulnerability that occurs in applications and web applications that utilize NoSQL databases. And it is a type of attack that involves an attacker manipulating a NoSQL database query by injecting malicious input, leading to unauthorized access, data leakage, or unintended operations. In traditional SQL injection attacks, attackers exploit vulnerabilities by inserting malicious SQL code or queries into application inputs or input fields that are concatenated with database queries. Similarly, in NoSQL injection, attackers exploit weaknesses in the application's handling of user-supplied input to manipulate the NoSQL database query. So it pretty much remains the same with regards to the uh, methodology of identification and exploitation. So if you compare it to SQL injection, you're still going to be required to find an application input, preferably one that does not have any input validation. And secondly, that application input needs to be interacting with the database uh, in this case, the NoSQL database based on the nature of data that is being submitted. So the identification process remains the same. As I said, it just comes down to the payloads that you utilize. Now, the best way to demonstrate how this works is to use an example. So let's assume we have a web application that utilizes MongoDB as the NoSQL database backend. The application has a login functionality where users provide their username and password and the application performs a query to check if the provided credentials are valid. So this is uh, how it handles the input. So we have a variable username that's equal to get request parameter, which is username, and this is string based, and this is all user supplied input, the same for the password. And then what happens is the MongoDB query will look like uh, the following. So uh, we have the variable query that stores the uh, values of username and password provided by the uh, user. And then the query here will perform a check to see if the credentials are valid. So we're really targeting the weakness of the actual query. In this case, the uh, mo the actual uh, Mongo query language or MQL. So variable result equals to, and remember we ran this in the previous video, db.users, that could be a database or collection. In this case, the function being used is find one. So instead of matching two, they're finding one. So either username or password needs to match if there, uh, if result, uh, if there is a result from uh, the MongoDB server or the database, as it were, then the login is successful. If there's no result, uh, that means that login is failed, and then the web application responds based on what it, result it gets from the actual uh, backend uh, DB. In this case, MongoDB. So in this example, the application constructs a MongoDB query using user supplied values for the username and password files. If an attacker intentionally provides a specially crafted value, they could potentially exploit a NoSQL injection vulnerability. For instance, an attacker might enter the following value or they might inject the following value as the username parameter. So they might inject greater than and then you know leave it blank and that will return a result uh, if not sanitized or if, if the query the actual MongoDB query is not set up correctly, this would evaluate to pretty much displaying uh, all other values or other, all other documents within that particular collection. So in a normal scenario, the query would search for a user with the exact username provided. However, in this case, the attacker is utilizing the greater than operator uh, with an empty string as the value. This can manipulate the query's logic, causing it to retrieve a user record that the attacker uh, should not have access to. The attacker could then potentially bypass the login mechanism and gain unauthorized access. And that's true. Uh, you might be asking yourself, are authentication bypasses possible with NoSQL databases? Yes, they are. Um, and uh, that brings me to the final slide here where I've sort of listed out some examples of uh, NoSQL injection payloads, for, uh, primarily for login forms here, where you can see we have the username and the password as parameters. And what you can do is set the, uh, you can utilize the following operation. So our logical operator like not equals to, equ uh, and then equals to the username. And this is typically what's used for authentication bypasses, depending on the query. You can also check for a regular expression. Again, the same thing is used for authentication bypasses. Uh, this one right over here is used to perform uh, or checks the rejects to find the length of a value. So typically for brute force against username uh, 
the values of the username parameter. And then this one is the equals to, which also works for authentication bypasses in certain cases, depending on the query. And then uh, the greater than right over here. Now, if you want to learn more about NoSQL injection, and uh, if you want to uh, find some additional NoSQL injection payloads, I highly recommend you take a look at the uh, payload, all the things GitHub repo, specifically the NoSQL injection section, because it sort of outlines the different payloads to use in different uh, circumstances or scenarios. And that brings us to the live lab or the practical section of this course. So as I said, uh, this video has a lab associated with it. This lab will not provide you with your own Kali Linux system. It's not required. It's just going to open up a web application that is vulnerable to NoSQL injection. And uh, we can pretty much perform the injection directly via the URL. So it's going to be very simple. It'll sort of give you a feel as to what uh, NoSQL injection is all about. So I'm going to start up the lab and I'll see you there. All right, so I am back in my Kali Linux VM and this is the target web application. It's a very simple search web application and uh, you can see that it allows us to search for users. And in the back end, we have a MongoDB uh, database server running and you can see the output will tell us the name of the user, the password and whether the user is admin. Now, if we try and search for a user manually and hit search, you can see that that uh, value is passed uh, in or rather whatever we put in or input it is passed in as the value of a parameter called name. All right. And, uh, you know, this user doesn't exist. So there's no output. Now you could typically try your common uh, SQL injection uh, error based hunting here where we put a single quote, but that will not give us anything. So what we need, what we can do is if we say, for example, admin, just to see if that user exists, we can say admin. And yes, admin exists and you can see name is admin, password is also admin and uh, this user is an admin. So this is confirmed. Um, this is uh, essentially uh, how the web application works from a uh, behavior perspective. Now, how can we get this uh, login or this particular form input form here? How can we uh, perform NoSQL injection to maybe display all other users uh, within the database or within the actual uh, database and collection? We don't know anything about the query. If we view the page source here, um, we can see that, uh, yeah, we don't have any info regarding the actual query that's been documented on the page itself. So uh, the way what we can typically do, and this is a very quick NoSQL injection bypass is we can pass in a logical operation here um, before the actual value of the parameter. So we can say in here in square brackets, uh, we can utilize the logical operator not equal to admin. So what this is going to do is it's going to run the query and it's going to set the uh, name parameter to not equal or not be equal to anything. So in that case, this should display all of the other users within the uh, within the actual collection, or in this particular case, all the other documents. So we'll hit enter, and there we are. So that is, in essence, NoSQL injection. I know it's a very, very simple demo, but it sort of explains or demonstrates how this works with regards to logical operations. So based on the construction of this query, it was just looking for a match, right, for admin or whatever we input here. Now, when we say it's uh, not equal to, it'll still return a result, right? In this case, the result of this will be pretty much to display all other documents uh, within the collection, right? And you can see the various fields. We have uh, the name, password, and whether the user is admin. So hopefully this makes sense. Now we can also say, you know, greater than, if we hit enter, we'll pretty much get the same thing. Now, what happens if we say name equals to a user that doesn't exist? Do we have a user called test? No, we don't. So if we say uh, name is, and uh, we'll put in the square, square brackets, and we we'll say not equals to, and hit enter, you can see that works. And if we don't put anything in here, that will still work. All right. So this is just a, a poorly designed uh, MongoDB query or, you know, Mongo query language uh, query or MQL query, as it were. Uh, and this is a, sort of an example as to uh, this is an example as to uh, what or how uh, NoSQL injection works. Uh, and it all comes down to whether you're dealing with SQL injection or NoSQL injection. It all comes down to the actual construction of the query and input validation.
Now we can also utilize another one called uh, none of the array or none in the array. So we can say NIN and then hit enter. And in this case is not going to match. So if we say test now, uh, this in certain cases usually works where we can uh, specify maybe, um, you know, if we wanted to match none of the values of the array uh, and then specify users or values we don't want to match, uh, that can also be useful. Uh, we can also utilize the equals to operator here but just by saying EQ. So EQ and uh, we can say equals test and that will return nothing. But we can say EQ uh, equals test and then, you know, for example, we could say or pass in, uh, you know, additional parameters or additional operators here. Uh, but this is typically what you're going to be dealing with. Uh, and again, this is not a login form, but uh, in certain cases, you may, when dealing with Mongo, uh, MongoDB, you may need to put in um, the, uh, the absolute values for logical operators. So for example, that would typically be, um, let's see if I can show you this here. So if we say, for example, I will uh, terminate and then we can say or uh, one equals one and uh, we use the comment there. So we'll just hit search and you can see that's input incorrectly. So we have to put it, uh, this is uh, in this particular case, we have to utilize the logical operators before the actual value. So uh, in this case, you know, we can just say test and then we can say uh, in here, uh, or um, one equals one. So these are the absolute um, uh, alternatives to the actual text-based logical operators. We hit enter, there we are. So you can see in this particular case, we can say, for example, uh, greater than, and in this case, that's not passed in correctly, but you get the idea. So we could say, you know, test and that, uh, name uh, greater than equals test. Uh, if we say for a user that exists, then it should display it. But if we put it for a user that doesn't, greater than does not work. So when we say greater than, it's just going to show other records greater than admin. However, if the record doesn't exist, in this case, it still works. That's very interesting. We say uh, test. Okay, that doesn't work. Uh, greater than test. So if we say anything greater than A, it'll display it. So you can also use the characters here. We can say anything greater than Z, nothing there, anything greater than F. We only have hidden flag because it starts with H. All right. In this case, what's being searched for is the name field specifically. So uh, hopefully all of this makes sense. I just wanted to give you the, this uh, sort of uh, introductory foray into NoSQL injection. As I said, it's something we'll be exploring in even more advanced environments as we proceed in this uh, learning path, as well as more advanced learning paths. Uh, but it's becoming increasingly prevalent. And hopefully by the end of this section now, uh, you should have a good feel and understanding as to what NoSQL injection is all about. With that being said, that's going to uh, bring us to the close of the practical section of this video. All right, so that brings us to the end of the NoSQL injection section of this course and the end of the course as a whole. So hopefully you've learned uh, a lot within this section and the other sections within this course, and you now should have a firm grip of uh, SQL injection attacks as well as uh, no SQL injection uh, attacks or vulnerabilities, more so the former as opposed to the latter. As I said, the no SQL injection uh, section was something that I added as a bonus uh, to essentially get you curious and uh, you know to the point where you can go out there and obviously legally and ethically try and play around with no SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, with that being said, we're now going to go on to the final video of the course, which is the course conclusion. It's a very important video because it's uh, essentially a report card check and will allow us to see how far we've come and whether we hit uh, all of our learning objectives or outcomes for this course. With that being said, I'll be seeing you in the course conclusion video. Hello everyone and welcome to the SQL injection attacks course conclusion. So as I've mentioned uh, severally or many times during the 
uh, course or the length of the course, this video is very, very important to me because it uh, allows me to say goodbye to everyone and uh, sort of wish them the best moving forward and obviously get them excited for the next courses. However, the, se the second or rather the most important uh, reason as to why this video is important to me is because it allows us to align with the course introduction video where I sort of uh, laid out what we'll be covering in this particular course and what the learning objectives are. And we now get a chance to reflect and take a look at whether we hit all of those learning objectives. And indeed, if you go ahead and take a look at the course introduction, you should see that it uh, still matches the learning objectives that I have here. So uh, in other words, we've pretty much hit everything that we were supposed to with regards to what you should be able to do uh, after the course. Uh, or what you should be able to do now as you've just uh, arrived at the conclusion, as well as uh, the key information that you should know or that you should have an understanding of. So just to go over it again, uh, by the end of this course, which is where we are right now, you should have a solid understanding of what a SQL injection vulnerability is, what causes them or what causes it and what the potential impact of the vulnerability is. You should also have a solid understanding of how relational databases and NoSQL databases work and how they differ from one another. You should also have an understanding of the three different categories or types of SQL injection vulnerabilities and their respective subtypes, as of course, as well as how they work, which we also covered. Uh, you should also be able to understand and write basic SQL queries. We did that really well. Uh, you should also be able to uh, identify and exploit in-band SQL injection vulnerabilities, those being error-based SQL injection and union-based SQL injection. You should also be able to identify and exploit blind SQL injection vulnerabilities, both time-based SQL injection and Boolean-based SQL, uh, SQL injection. And you should also have the ability to automate the identification and exploitation of SQL injection vulnerabilities with tools like SQL Map, as well as others that we uh, that weren't in the learning objectives, but we still covered, like uh, the use of web proxies like uh, OASP Zap and Burp Suite, which really helped us a lot. And finally, uh, you will be able to identify and exploit vulnerabilities in NoSQL databases, or in essence, perform NoSQL injection. So as you can see, if you go back through everything you've learned, this is everything that you should know, as well as everything that you should be able to do after completing the course. So I'm really, really satisfied with how far we've gotten. So in the beginning, you may have not uh, known anything about uh, SQL or databases or SQL injection, but now I'm pretty sure that uh, I've been able to cover the foundation or the fundamentals, that being, you know, databases, SQL, writing SQL, understanding how databases work, how they're used, the different types of databases. And then, of course, moving that on into the web application space, we're able to take a look at, you know, hi uh, hunting for SQL injection vulnerabilities, both manually and automatically, how to identify them, and then, of course, how to exploit them. And uh, it's been a very, very long journey, but uh, hopefully uh, you have uh, you have learned a lot. And uh, yeah, so that brings me to the end of the course. I really want to thank you for going through the course if you've made it this far. And I hope you're really excited. The uh, ultimate objective at the end of the course is for you to be really excited about uh, not just SQL injection vulnerabilities, but also no SQL injection vulnerabilities. And hopefully this uh, sets the stage for you to explore this vulnerability even more. I uh, definitely recommend, you know, trying out some of the other INE labs and uh, yeah, uh, just go ahead and learn more about the uh, vulnerability, try it out with different labs, uh, test out different uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, there's so much more that you can do. Uh, with that being said, I would like to say thank you once again, and uh, I hope I'll be seeing you in the next course here at INE.